hearing um, of the Subcommittee on Health Care and Financial Services will come to order. Welcome, everyone. Without objection, the chair may declare a recess at any time. I recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement. Wait. One second. Oh, we're missing, we're missing a witness. We're missing a witness. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, I recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement. Quite simply, men do not belong in women's sports. Let me say it one more time. Men do not belong in women's sports. The simple fact is that this, that this needs to be said out loud is really kind of a sad reflection of where the other side is on this issue. There should be no debate about this. However, we are here today because the Biden administration is choosing to ignore the truth, and I might add the science. The truth is, is that by allowing biological males to compete in women's sports is fundamentally un fair. It is also unsafe. Scientific evidence, and I'll say that again, scientific evidence affirms that biological males and females have unchangeable physiological differences attributed to their sex. Some of these di differences benefit male athletes. For example, males typically have greater muscle mass, lung muscle mass, lung capacity, and bone density than females. All of these characteristics give males a competitive advantage over females. This is why women should compete against women and men should not compete against them. That is what Title IX was designed to protect. By allowing biological males to compete in women's sports, we are placing our daughters in danger every time they step onto the field. This hearing is about protecting women, period. That's it. I'm standing up for the rights of women, children, my daughter, your daughter, our granddaughters. I'm frustrated as I continue to hear about female athletes who are injured by biological males competing in women's sports. I'm a mother. I have two daughters. Any parent will tell you that their most sacred responsibility is to protect their children. And that's what I'm trying to do. And that's what this hearing is about. That's why today, is about protecting our daughters, our nieces, and our granddaughters. It's time for us to get off the sideline and actually stand up for them. Unfortunately, the Biden administration has shown that is putting leftist policies before women and girls. In a fraudulent effort to be inclusive, the Biden administration is sacrificing equality. Instead of defending the hard-fought protections that Title IX secured. I mean, think of how long we fought for Title IX, for equality for women. The Biden administration has proposed two rules that will drastically alter Title IX. The Biden administration proposed rule, proposed rule redefines sex to include gender identity and expand Title IX protections to biological males. Protections that were created and implemented for women and girls. 
If the Biden administration is successful, it will mean that more women will lose, lose out on academic and athletic opportunities that should have been afforded to them under Title IX. Again, the whole reason we put together Title IX. Last year, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Title IX's enactment. For the last 50 years, we've seen Title IX's success in securing equality for women across the country. We cannot allow this administration to dismantle the rights and protections that women fought so hard to achieve. We must protect women and girls, and I encourage my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to stay, to stay centered on this issue throughout the hearing. To our panel, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here today before the subcommittee. I'm looking forward to having to having this very important discussion with you. And I now recognize the, man, the ranking member, Ms. Lee, for your opening statement. Ms. Lee? Thank you, Madam Chair. It's disappointing to me that although the title of this hearing implies a much needed discussion, we're likely going to be forced to listen to transphobic bigotry. Because actually, protecting female athletes in Title IX is important. Participating in sports provides so many benefits to our young people. Those benefits range from improved mental and physical health to enriched life skills, such as teamwork and goal setting. In terms of mental health, studies show that participating in youth sports is associated with lower rates of anxiety and depression, lower amounts of stress, higher self-esteem and confidence, and reduced risk of suicide. So why are my Republican colleagues working so hard to prevent our trans youth from participating? According to the Human Rights Campaign, in just the first 143 days of 2023, elected officials across the nation introduced more than 520 anti-LGBTQIA bills in state legislatures. 23 states banned trans youth from participating in school sports consistent with their gender identity, with some laws focusing on kids as young as kindergarten. How competitive is kindergarten? You all are working so hard at excluding and demonizing a bunch of kids. I think it's important that we raise the voices of transgender athletes, their families, and teammates. I'd like to read a few of their stories written in the first person. The first from Cece Telfer, a professional track athlete, model, and advocate. I was a former D2 national champion in the 400 meter hurdles. And I am now a professional athlete training to make it on the Team USA and represent them in the following Olympics to come. Sports have given me a plethora of things, but mainly sports have given me strength, taught me how to overcome fear and stand up when defeated. Sports have given me collaborative skills that was developed throughout the years of being an athlete and having teammates. Sports taught me how to stay focused and committed, along with the necessary skills that sports has taught me and giving me clarity and freedom. Transgender women and girls, transgender people are not a threat. We don't play sports to cheat. We deserve the rights as any other women because that's what we are. There are rules and regulation that define our ability to compete. The narrative that builds on myself and trans kids in the community is negative and dehumanizing. It feels as though people don't want us to exist. And in order to change the narrative, because we do exist, and we're not going to stop existing, we need to stop these anti-trans bills. They are dehumanizing and kids are dying. Instead, I believe the government should step up and support trans people on all levels to show that we are seen and have rights and are people just like everybody else. From Ember, a transgender female high school softball player. When I was younger, I played co-ed baseball. I loved it. When the teams became single sex, I no longer fit in. I was teased and ostracized, though the most difficult part was not feeling like myself, so I quit. I came out as trans in seventh grade and wanted to play softball, but my state requires trans girls to take hormones for a year before they can play a sport. So I waited for three years. During that time, I became self-conscious, uncomfortable with my body, and lost all of my confidence. I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety. I was finally approved to play on a girls team in the spring of my sophomore year of high school. Playing on a girls team has been an incredible experience for me. I have made so many friends and improved so much despite starting, starting so late. My teammates treat me just like everyone else on the team. So do my coaches. My team is part of my family. We are all so different and come from different cliques. But when we're together on the field, we are there for each other no matter what. Every kid should be lucky enough to have this experience. And from Debbie Jackson, a parent of a non-binary team. 
My child Avery is now 15 years old. Avery doesn't even remember what it was like to be viewed as a boy. We affirmed who they are at a young age and supported a social transition before kindergarten. During that time, Avery was in a co-ed trampoline class at a gym at a local gym. The gymnastics classes at the gym were divided by gender, and as we began referring to Avery as our daughter, Avery asked to move into gymnastics. It was one additional step towards being affirmed and accepted authentically. To this day, some of my favorite photos and videos are from the first day of that class when Avery marched so confidently onto the mats with a barely grown out traditional boy, boyish haircut next to a gaggle of other girls with their bouncy ponytails. Avery enthusiastically followed every word of the coach, trying forward rolls and falling off the balance beam with every step, literally every step. Avery was the most gloriously awkward, non-athletic creature I have ever witnessed. I can safely tell you that Avery is still a gloriously awkward, non-athletic creature who will never win in any athletic endeavor. But participating in sports isn't about winning. Playing sports helps with mental health, teaches teamwork, provides camaraderie with others, and teaches discipline and goal setting. It opens doors to friendship, connection, and community with others. That's what my child experienced in that gymnastics class, and other trans kids deserve to experience all of those benefits too. I am so thankful that Avery didn't have to choose between not participating in sports or being forced to participate as a boy. Forcing a transgender child to choose between living an authentic life and playing a game is cruel. Think about how it would feel to have your body openly discussed by others or have the fairness of your existence and basic rights debated in a public forum. That's what you are doing to innocent kids. Please leave our kids alone. They deserve so much better from people in power. I want to thank these people for sharing their stories and reminding us that this is about children and daughters and sons and siblings and friends. These are real people with real experiences who deserve to feel loved and included. I'd ask unanimous consent to enter these letters to the Committee for Transgender Ath Athletes provided by the National Center for Transgender Equality. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Sports are a vital aspect of education that offers important lessons. Athletics allows young people from diverse backgrounds to engage in healthy movement and play, learn how to work as a team, and form meaningful connections. Madam Chair, I ask that while we sit through this hearing and hear the hateful misinformation, I'm sure is going to come our way. Let us not forget that children are at the core of this issue. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Lee. I will now recognize um, our witnesses for today. Ms. Riley Gaines is a former collegiate athlete for the University of Kentucky and now serves as an ambassador for the independent women's voice. Ms. Welcome. Ms. Sarah uh, Perry is a senior legal fellow in the Edwin Meese the third Center for Legal and Judi Judicial Studies at the Herited F Heritage Foundation. She is also a former senior counsel to the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Education. Ms. Kim Russell is the former head women's lacrosse coach at Oberlin College and now serves as an ambassador for the Independent Women's Forum. And finally, Mrs. Fatima Goss Graves is the president and CEO of the National Women's Law Center. Welcome and thank you again for all being here. Pursuant to the committee rule 9G, the witnesses will please stand and raise their right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give in this is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that the witness is answered in the affirmative. Thank you and you all, all take a seat. So again, um, I now recognize myself um, the witnesses, excuse me, I now recognize the witnesses for an opening statement. Let me remind the witnesses that we have read your written statement and we will have um, it appear in full in the hearing record. Please limit your oral statements to five minutes. As a reminder, please press the button on the microphone in front of you so that it is on and as the members can hear you. You will begin to speak, the light in front of you will turn green. After four, four minutes, the light will turn yellow, then the red light will come on. Your five minutes has expired, and we would ask you to please wrap up. I now recognize Ms. Gaines for her opening statement. Thank you. My name is Riley Gaines, and I'm an ambassador for Independent Women's Voice, and I'm here today to urge you to protect women's sports and, up and uphold the original intent of Title IX. My story is by now well known. I was a student at University of Kentucky, where I was also a member of the women's swim team, finishing my collegiate career as a 12-time NCAA All-American, a five-time SEC champion, still the SEC record holder in the 200 butterfly, making me one of the fastest Americans of all time. In March of 2022, female swimmers from around the country and I were forced to compete at NCAAs against Leah, formerly Will Thomas. We watched as this male swam to a women's national title, beating out the most impressive and accomplished female swimmers in the nation, 
including Olympians and American record holders. Despite tying down to the 100th with Thomas in the 200 freestyle, I was denied the trophy because the NCAA claimed it was necessary for Thomas to hold the trophy when photos were being taken. It was clear to me, my teammates, and my competitors that they had reduced everything we had worked our entire lives for down to a photo op to validate the feelings and the identity of a male. But that's not all. In addition to losing out on opportunities to Thomas, we also had to share a locker room and change in front of this six foot four, fully intact, naked male. And as I've testified previously, we were not forewarned of this arrangement, we were not asked for our consent, and we did not give our consent to this exposure and to be exploited. Unfortunately, Thomas was not a one-off. Across the country and in various sports, males are entering women's athletic competitions, being given spots on women's teams, and being granted entry to our locker rooms. There are numerous documented instances of males competing not just in women's swimming, but also in women's track, cross country, basketball, volleyball, field hockey, and other sports at all levels of competition. This issue is incredibly underreported for various reasons. But common sense Americans know intuitively that this is not fair to women. And science, of course, supports that instinct. In fact, studies consistently show males have about a 10 to 12% athletic advantage over females. This gap is evident in almost every sport and at every level of competition. Yes, hormone therapy can narrow this gap, but it cannot close it. And studies consistently demonstrate that surgery and testosterone suppression do not reduce male athletic performance to normal female levels. Take Thomas, for example. He was mediocre against the men at best, ranking 400s and 500s nationally, then dominating all of the women in the entire country by body lengths, might I add, in a matter of a year. Not only do women have to worry about losing opportunities and being exploited in locker rooms, allowing men into women's sports also puts girls at greater risk of injury. In September of last year, North Carolina high school volleyball player Peyton McNabb suffered serious injury after a trans-identified male player spiked a ball at her head, rendering her unconscious. Peyton experienced extensive trauma to her head and neck and long-term concussion symptoms. Still to this day, a year and three-ish months later, she is still partially paralyzed on her right side her vision is impaired, her memory is impaired, and she isn't playing college sports like she had dreamed of for herself. Just a few weeks ago in Massachusetts, a male player on the Swampscott High School field hockey women's team injured an opposing player with a shot to the face, sending the female athlete to the hospital with significant facial and dental injuries. Injuries, of course, can and do happen when females are playing against other females, but allowing men to play women's sports increases the likelihood and severity of such injuries. That's one of the reasons why, for 50 years, federal Title IX regulations have allowed schools to offer separate teams for women and men when the sports are contact sports or involve competitive skill. In April of 2023, the Department of Education proposed a rule that, if adopted, would reverse this presumption. Under the proposed rule, women's sports aren't just for women. They're for anyone who simply says they are a woman, unless a particular school can demonstrate to the satisfaction of the Department of Education that, can, that keeping a particular team, female, meets important educational objectives. The new rule mandates that every school in the country must demonstrate the unfairness of male participation on each specific women's team that they offer and develop rules that minimize harm to trans-identified athletes. But what about the harm to us? Who is working to minimize the harm done to female athletes? Let me be perfectly clear. A school that knowingly allows a male athlete to take a spot on a women's team or allows a male athlete to take the field in a women's game is denying a female student athletic opportunity. And that is sex-based discrimination and it violates Title IX, regardless of what the new regulations might say. It is my sincere hope that members of this committee, committee will take action to stop the Biden administration's illegal and administrative rewrite of Title IX. Of course, there is a place for everyone regardless of gender identity, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of race or what sports you play, there's a place for everyone to play sports in this country. But unsafe, unfair, and discriminatory practices towards women must stop. Inclusion cannot be prioritized over safety and fairness. And Ranking Member Lee, if my testi testimony makes me transphobic, then I believe your opening monologue makes you a misogynist. Thank you. I now, thank you, uh, Ms. Gaines. I now recognize Ms. Perry for her opening statements. Good afternoon, Chairman McLean, 
Ranking Member Lee and distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Sarah Parshall Perry. I am a senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation. As a former varsity athlete, the mother of a girls varsity athlete, and former senior counsel for civil rights at the Department of Education, I have, as the saying goes, uh, Madam Chair, excuse me, I move to have uh, the gentlewoman's words taken down. The committee will suspend. Madam Chair, she's engaging in personalities. Can I just ask how it's fair to be called transphobic? There's a thing. I would say men disguising themselves as women are engaging in personalities. Order. Yeah. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Order, order. Let's let's get a ruling. The chair. Okay, I move to withdraw the point of order. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Um, I now recognize Ms. Perry for her opening statement. We can start over. Thank you. Chairwoman McLean, Ranking Member Lee, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Sarah Parshall Perry. I am a senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation. As a former varsity athlete, the mother of a girls varsity athlete, and former senior counsel for civil rights at Department of Education, I have, as the saying goes, skin in this game. What we're discussing today is an athletic scandal, a fraud of unprecedented proportions perpetrated by the federal government on American students. It turns obvious distinctions between the sexes into nothing more than the myths of a bygone era, while expecting female athletes to simply look the other way. In education, one law should stand as a bulwark against sex discrimination as it has for the 50 years since its inception. And yet, the department's rulemaking on Title IX purports to provide for the participation of men in women's sports, rendering the sex discrimination of old, new again. Title IX made possible opportunities for women historically excluded from higher education, athletics, graduate school, scholarships, and more. Because of the law, the rate of girls' participation in high school athletics is now 1,000% higher. Girls now constitute over 56% of American college students and 42% of high school athletes and 94% of female executives played scholastic sports. Title IX was the crowning achievement of the feminist movement. Its origins incontrovertibly in women's liberation, spurred by statements made by the, the judge famously who proclaimed in 1971, athletic competition builds character in our boys. We don't need that kind of character in our girls. And yet, by threatening to gut Title IX's guarantee of equality, the department is on the cusp of perpetuating just this type of regressive thinking. There are two rules at issue, the latter of which governs criteria for athletics between athletic interests of women and transgender identified men, the department has called the rule a compromise, but a compromise it most definitely is not. Instead, it is a self-refuting tangle of considerations, a bureaucratic nightmare for any educational institution to which it applies. It doesn't clarify Title IX's sex-based criteria in sports. It complicates it. It departs from decades of Title IX's application to athletics, obscures the plain text of the long-standing athletics regulation with vague terms, an unworkable standard, and the guaranteed conflict with the contrary laws of 2013 three states. It balances the equities against the women and girls who are at the heart of Title IX's passage and impressively does all this while violating constitutional, civil rights, and administrative law. The coup de grace 
There is a reason to argue that the department even lacks the authority to promulgate an athletics regulation in the first place. Then there is the rule's refusal to acknowledge obvious sex-based competitive advantages to sport. Males have greater lung capacity, larger hearts, more bone density, more muscle mass. They jump higher, throw further, run faster, accelerate quicker, and punch harder than females. And this gap emerges as early as the age of 12 when males experience a 20-fold boost in testosterone. Title IX and its implementing regulations contain a set of limited sex affirmative exceptions allowing schools to take sex into account and a sex binary. Male versus female is the foundation upon which the entire statute rests. Its use of the words both and either reinforces this longstanding understanding. Even the Supreme Court's determination in Bostock versus Clayton County that sex discrimination in employment also includes discrimination based on sexual orientation and transgender status does nothing to change that, nor did the Supreme Court intend to. When biological boys are glibly classified as girls, the feminist gains of the past 50 years are eviscerated. Womanhood cannot be achieved by puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones, and it deserves the continued protection of Title IX. I urge this chamber not to rewind the clock on women's progress, but rather hold fast to the principles of equality. The future of women's sports depends on it. If a self-declaration of womanhood and hormones are sufficient to open women's sports to men, what, after all, was the point of the women's liberation movement? I welcome your questions. Thank you, Ms. Perry. The chair now recognizes Ms. Russell for her opening statement. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all for being here. I'm Kim Russell, an ambassador for the Independent Women's Forum. Why am I here? I'm 56 years old. I'm an athlete, a coach, a mother, and a teacher, and a longtime advocate for women and girls. This has been my life and my passion. I played two sports at the D1 level that never would have been possible without Title IX. I've been a lacrosse coach for over 27 years. I'm in three halls of fame for coaching and contributing to the growth of lacrosse, and there's actually an award in my name. Oberlin College removed me from coaching and offered me an administrative position after I chose to publicly tell my story and refused to be silent or back down about my belief that men, no matter how they self-identify, should not be allowed to compete in women's sports. I joined Oberlin College in 2018 as a head women's lacrosse coach and a wellness instructor. I've always been pro-woman then and now. Over the course of my coaching career, I've been a mentor to many women and girls, sharing advice both on and off the field. My athletes, including several who've identified as transgender, have always known they can come to me to laugh, to cry, or anything in between. I've been nicknamed the hippie love coach. Not only because I'm a yoga instructor, I'm usually barefoot, these shoes are not my typical wear. Um, I read energy and coach intuitively, but because I've given countless individuals a safe space to thrive and feel a sense of belonging. In March of 2022, I'd been following the story of Leah Thomas and kept thinking someone would speak up. How could a biological male be allowed to compete with women regardless of a hormone blocking regime? I was flabbergasted that coaches, parents, administrators, and athletes were okay with this. After Thomas won, I reposted an Instagram post on my personal story that said, congratulations to Emma Wayant, the real woman who won the NCAA 500 yard freestyle. I added my own short commentary. What do you believe? I can't be quiet on this. I've spent my entire life playing sports, coaching, and starting sports programs for girls and women. Turns out, it was more controversial than I could have ever anticipated. Based on this simple post, I was called transgressive, transphobic, and unsafe. I was told to write letters of apology to my team and the athletic department because of the unrest and disruption I had caused. I couldn't apologize for something that I'm not sorry for. I would not and will not apologize for saying a biological male does not belong in women's sports and private spaces. 
As an athlete and coach for nearly my entire life, I am personally familiar with the distinct differences between male and female athletes. I gave birth to four kids. I ran the sidelines nursing a child while I coached in the state championships, and I've had another child on my back at the same time. After I refused to apologize, I was called in for a meeting of my team with a mediator present. A handful of the student athletes on my team attacked and vilified me as if I were the enemy and had just killed someone. A week later, there was another meeting with my team and three college administrators for one hour and 42 minutes, the same athletes who I had treated like my own kids bashed me over and over again in front of the administrators simply for having a pro-woman perspective that was different from theirs. I had to stay quiet and repeat back everything they said and confirm that I had heard their concerns. At the end of the meeting, I was given the chance to respond, at which point I knew whatever I said would land on deaf ears. I was called into the AD's office as after the season ended and handed a letter. At the bottom it said, this letter is intended to help you understand and appreciate the impact of your actions and the need for you to immediately modify your behavior. I asked Oberlin to provide me with a written letter on what I had done wrong and how I could improve my behavior, but was never provided any clarity. When I arrived at Oberlin in 2018, I was so excited to be part of a community that celebrates free spirit, open-minded dialogue, freedom of speech, and freedom of expression. I'm the hippie love coach. I thought I was home. But Oberlin, like many higher level institutions today, only seems to support the First Amendment if your values align with theirs. Most people have chosen to stay silent in this topic because of the consequences seem too great. Loss of a job, reputation, friends or family, you name it. I am here in part to speak for them. I will never apologize for believing that women and girls should have the right to single sex competition, a right for which women before me fought tirelessly. I'm hoping that my speaking up will give others the courage to do the same. I am here hoping to ensure that you understand the ramifications of the Biden administration's proposed regulations and that you will each do your job to ensure that the original meaning of Title IX is upheld. It was passed when I was five. I have reaped the benefits and my life's journey continues to be massively impacted. The Biden administration is trying to effectively change the meaning and language of Title IX. If allowed, this will endanger women in sports and private spaces, take away opportunities from women in sports and academia. Never in a million years did I think I would be sitting here at 56 fighting to get back the rights that were given to women and girls 51 years ago. Since March of 2022, many more biological males have invaded women's and girls' sports. There have been life-changing injuries, opportunities lost, and privacy has been invaded. We are harming women and girls. You have the opportunity to be heroes. This is about upholding truth, protecting the dreams of female athletes, and the original meaning of Title IX. Thank you, Ms. Russell. The chair ne next recognizes Ms. Goss Graves. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman McLean, Ranking Member Lee, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Fatima Goss Graves, and I'm President and CEO of the National Women's Law Center. The National Women's Law Center was founded the same year that Title IX was passed and has worked to remove barriers for women and girls throughout the course of their lives throughout our founding. And since I have had the great honor to engage in this critical work, including as an advocate for women and girls in school and in sports. In fact, my first Title IX matter uh, was more than 15 years ago where we worked to successfully secure equal facilities for girls in a school district in Maryland. And over the last 50 years, Title IX has dramatically advanced women and girls' participation in school sports. High school girls have three million more opportunities to play today than they did before Title IX. And 44% of NCAA athletes today are now women, compared to only 15% before Title IX. But significant barriers to gender equity in sport persist. 
Women and girls have over one million fewer opportunities to play in high school than boys. Some schools still treat girls and women's teams as afterthoughts. We hear complaints of uniforms and equipment that are essentially second class. They aren't afforded the same level of publicity to showcase their many talents. And women in professional sports consistently complain about gender bias in pay. And we have all learned of case after case of sexual abuse against student athletes, which schools overlooked the deplorable conduct by coaches and athletic trainers and school doctors. These barriers to gender equity in sports are well documented and they are pervasive. Yet none of that is the subject of the hearing today. And said today is really about attacking and dehumanizing transgender people, and especially trans women and girls. And even though trans youth are not responsible for any of the problems in sport that I have named, and still we have seen at least 24 states who have been racing to move to ban trans students from women and girls sports teams falsely claiming they are protecting women's sports. That's just not true. We know from data collected from between 2008 and 2019 that including trans student athletes correlates with increased participation by all girls. In contrast, girls' overall participation in high school sports declined in states that enacted trans exclusionary policies. So let me put it really plainly, excluding women and girls who are trans hurts all women and girls. The irony is this debate about including trans women and girls in sports should sound familiar to anyone who has tracked the evolution of Title IX over the last five decades, because at its root are sexist stereotypes that equate femininity with being slower and weaker and likely unathletic. Athletes come in all shapes and sizes, and rigid enforcement of who is a woman is dangerous and only encourages further discrimination. It invites the sort of gender policing that could subject any woman to accusations of being too masculine or too good or not a real enough woman to participate. The reality is that like their peers, trans girls and women, they sometimes lose at sports and sometimes they win. And success in school sports depends on a whole range of factors, including how hard you work and coaching and access to really good resources and facilities. And trans students participate in sports for the same reason as their kids, because it is fun, because it creates belonging and community, because it teaches so much about persistence and leadership and, and discipline, unless they learn to lose gracefully, hopefully, and often they learn to win with dignity, hopefully. Um, they learn to do the sort of work that means you have higher grades and stay connected to school. I want every kid to have that chance, to have the chance to play. So I feel compelled to just end my testimony with a few ideas for the committee to pursue if it really wants to work on this issue. We could make it safer for student athletes who report harassment and sexual misconduct. We could address resource disparities in sports. We could protect access to health care, including gender affirming and reproductive health care, pay, promotions, dealing with the caregiving crisis in this country. All of that could be your agenda. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, Ms. Gossgraves. Um, I would just like to remind everybody the title of the hearing, since it is my hearing. Um, and the title of the hearing is The Importance of Protecting Female Athletes in Title IX. I, I am for protecting women. We fought very, very long and very hard to protect women. So I, I just want to be clear, there's not a hidden agenda. It is actually to protect women in women's sports. So since it's my hearing, I just wanted to clarify that is my agenda. With that, um, without objection, uh, Representative, Representative Jordan 
of Ohio, Representative Sessions of Texas, Representatives Green of Georgia, Representative Boebert of Colorado, Representative Burchett of Tennessee, Representative Waltz of Florida, Representative LaMalfa of California, and Representative Garcia of California are waived onto the subcommittee for the purpose of questioning the witnesses at today's subcommittee hearing. I ask unanimous consent to enter five statements into the record, a legal memorandum by Ms. Sarah Perry titled The Department of Education's Intended Revision of Title IX Fails Regulatory and Civil Rights Analysis, a second legal me memorandum by Mrs. Sarah per Perry titled One More with Feeling, Department of Education Releases Set second Title IX rule and fails again. A report from the Independent Women's Forum and the Independent Women's Law Center titled Competition, Title IX, Male-Bodied Athletes and the Threat to Women's Sports. An article from the Daily Signal, Signal titled Exclusive School Assigned Girls to Sleep with Boys Who Identify as Trans Without Parental Notification. And a statement for the record submitted by the NCAA on December 4th, 2023, without objection, so ordered. Um, the chair now recognizes. Right. Chairman Comer. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing, <clears throat> protecting female sports and Title IX. Uh, as a Kentuckian, when I think about great Kentucky female athletes, uh, our witness, Riley Gaines, is the first name that, that pops out. And Riley, on behalf of every great Kentucky Wildcat fan in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, we thank you uh, for how well you represented Kentucky uh, on the national level and for your advocacy today in being a leading voice in protecting women's sports. Ms. Gaines, has Title IX had a positive impact on your access to athletic and academic opportunities? Of course it has. Uh, I would not have been able to achieve what I achieved without Title IX, without the women's sporting category. Uh, of course, it's developed me into the leader uh, that I am today. It's given me the confidence to stand before this committee uh, and the security to stand firm in, in my belief that men should not be playing in women's sports. I know we had a witness that suggested that because you worked so hard all your life, to be the best. I mean, you were the best in female swimming. There's no question about that. And to have to lose or share a title with a biological male, you know, we had a, a witness on the panel suggest you should have just lost gracefully. I mean, I, I think that is a slap in the face to, to any athlete who works so hard. I mean, I, I, I was a, a below mediocre basketball player of my high school basketball team, I can't imagine uh, the work that you put in that any great athlete, male or female, puts in. Uh, and I don't think you should lose gracefully. I think you should do exactly what you've been doing. Uh, you're a class act and you've been a leader. You've told your story. Many of us on this side of the aisle have heard your story many times and uh, we respect what you're doing and we, we stand with you. I just want you to know that. Well, I appreciate that uh, a whole lot. And just for the record, I have certainly lost gracefully many times in my career. Uh, even speaking to the incident of Thomas and I at the national championships, we tied for fifth. Granted, fifth in the entire nation, so it's still an incredible achievement. Uh, but there were four women who beat me, and I'm incredibly proud of those women who beat me. Uh, so I certainly can and have lost gracefully many times in my career. I lose gracefully a lot on the golf course. Not, not really, but I lose a lot on the golf course. Uh, Coach Russell, if the Biden administration successfully redefines Title IX to include gender identity, are you concerned that young women will miss out on athletic and academic opportunities that would be afforded to them? Absolutely. So not only would uh, biological males be able to take the positions on teams away from females, that includes then scholarship money at different levels. It includes awards at different levels. It includes now NIL money, so sponsorship money. Um, it's not just a one-off. There are many different levels that that will hit, yes. Well, uh, Madam Chair, before I yield back, I just want to thank our, our witnesses who are here today advocating for female sports and, and Title IX. This is a great hearing, and uh, we look forward to working with you to, as a majority, to protect women's sports in Title IX moving forward. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back.
Thank you. The chair now recognizes Ms. Lee from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Or five minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering if it was five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I must say I'm surprised to hear that my Republican colleagues care so much about protecting the, quote, safety, privacy, and opportunities of women since their voting record and priorities this Congress shows the opposite. A report released last year in conjunction with the 50th anniversary of Title IX found that men's athletic programs received more than twice as many resources as women's programs in 2020, and that expenditures for recruiting and compensating head coaches and assistant coaches favored male athletes nearly three to one. Yet the 2024 appropriations bill did nothing to expand access for women in sports. It did, however, contain a rider to prevent the proposed Department of Education rule relating to transgender athletes' ability to participate in sports. Ms. Gossgraves, to your knowledge, do any of the bans preventing transgender students from participating in sports increase funding for women's sports? No, they do not. Do any of these bans improve playing fields or increase the number of women's teams? Absolutely not. Do any of these bans provide resources to expand recreational sports opportunities for low-income female athletes? No. While this committee purports to care about the safety of women, in 2021, when the House voted to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act, 80% of the Republican caucus voted against that law. Not a single Republican member of this committee, nor our current speaker, voted for it. That bill included a provision to close the boyfriend loophole. Currently, people convicted of domestic violence against a spouse cannot purchase a firearm, but nothing prevents a boyfriend from acquiring one. Ms. Gossgraves, unlike gun violence, where the data is clear, is there any evidence that allowing transgender athletes to participate in sports presents a safety concern for women? Absolutely not. Because my Republican colleagues also claim to be concerned about women's privacy and opportunities, Let's also discuss the Women's Health Protection Act, which passed in the House last year and would protect and expand access to abortion care. Not a single Republican voted for this law. The right to abortion is rooted directly in the right to privacy. And research has repeatedly shown that the ability to access abortion corresponds with greater economic opportunities for women. Ms. Gossgraves, is there any reason to believe that allowing transgender young people to participate in sports threatens women's privacy or employment or economic opportunities? None of those things are threatened by the participation of transgender individuals in sports. Thank you. In fact, isn't there a risk that banning transgender athletes could lead to privacy violations, either through requiring documentation or invasive examinations? I, that it, there is a deep worry there, and some states have passed that sort of sex verification law, which would subject all women and girls to those sorts of examinations. Ms. Gossgraves, what should we actually focus on if we want to protect opportunities for women in sports? There is an opportunity right now to promote further resources to address sexual abuse that is happening in sports, to provide the sort of resources that mean more kids have an opportunity to play, and to advocate for, that the Biden administration finalize this rule that has been waiting for so long. That's where we are. We've seen these same misguided arguments before, rooted in false stereotypes, when athletes of color tried to, tried to integrate white sports leagues who were accused of taking away opportunities from white athletes. Black women in sports, whether they are cis, trans, or intersex, constantly encounter shifting roles and expectations as a reprimand for their success. They are accused of doping or cheating in order to win. People make cruel remarks about their perceived femininity and create racist depictions of their physicality, all in attempts to discourage and exclude them from competing, and ultimately to keep them from winning. They were wrong then, and they're wrong now. I'm offended to see hatred and bigotry wrapped up in faux concerns about women and girls. We're talking about children wanting to play sports, wanting to feel included and accepted, I'd like to quote the Republican governor from Utah, Governor Cox's veto message, who said, quote, rarely has so much fear and anger been directed at so few. I don't understand what they are going through or why they feel the way they do, but I want them to live. I yield back. And I'll recognize myself for five minutes. Ms. Gaines, why is it patently unfair to allow biological males to compete in women's sports? Uh, I mean, look at, the, look at what's happened. I mean, even if you just look at the examples recently, we don't see 
females entering into men's sports and dominating. This is only happening one way, and with that way being males entering into women's sports and dominating. Of course, I could get into the science of it. Uh, I mentioned the athletic gap in my testimony, which is consistent among sports, uh, specifically sports where there's a time, an objective time, like swimming or track and field. Uh, it tends to be 10 to 12 percent across the board. Uh, you look at things like wingspan or height or lung capacity or the size of the heart, which does not change with hormone suppression. Uh, and again, of course, going through puberty, those effects are, are irreversible. So you're actually telling us to follow the science? That is true. Uh, second question, I know that you have been active in working with Kappa Kappa Gamma sorority in Wyoming. Can you explain what is going on there and why it is so important that sororities remain female only? Absolutely, which is a part of, of, of course, this Title IX rewrite. It's a lot broader than just women's sports and sororities that are a part of it. Uh, what those girls at University of Wyoming are going through, and I know this because I talk to them daily. Uh, they just refiled their lawsuit this morning. Uh, what they're going through is nothing short of, I mean, it's perverse, allowing a male into their sorority house, uh, watching them as they shower and undress, walking around um, in the vein of being explicit here, but again, uh, true, walking around erect in their sorority house, asking them uncomfortable questions about what undergarments they wear, about their breasts, that's violating for any young girl, especially a college-age young girl who was promised sisterhood, mind you. Uh, granted, these girls got the brother they never wanted. Thank you, Ms. Perry. The Biden administration has claimed that their April 13, 2023 proposed rule governing Title IX and, athle and athletics will bring clarity. Is that true? Well, it wasn't until this administration where the definition of sex was ever anything other than clear. And in fact, the entire structure of Title IX is built on a sex binary. The purpose of regulatory law and the Administrative Procedure Act is to let the federal government contain and work on rules that clarify anything that might be perceived to be ambiguous. The previous administration had already released a Title IX rule in 2020, making very clear certain guidelines on sexual harassment and sexual assault. And until this administration, there was no ambiguity whatsoever. And what harm will come to our female athletes by redefining sex in Title IX to include gender identity? It's hard to quantify the market impacts of individual girls who are suddenly divested of the opportunities to achieve scholarships, play on athletic teams, to pursue the classes that they want, to ultimately, because we know there is a connection between success on the field and success later in life, these are individuals who are not only going to suffer those particular direct impacts, they'll bear the brunt in addition, there's going to be a market relationship fallout we have yet to even begin to quantify. And that to women and girls? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Let me real quickly, Ms. Russell, can you speak to your experiences with cancel culture and the treatment you received at Oberlin College because you stood up for women? My own children just say, Mama, you've been canceled twice. <laughs> um, Yes, I would say I, I went into Oberlin as, as a fairly liberal um, person. I still love everyone and support everyone, no matter who you want to be, what you want to, who you want to decide you want to present as. There are extreme differences in the biology of men and women. I've experienced it as an athlete and a coach and a parent. Um, as an athlete, I chose to play co-ed field hockey as an adult. My worst in injury I've ever had came from that. Um, a man fell on top of me when I fell this way. I'm 5'4", maybe 120 pounds soaking wet. I haven't ever been bigger except when I was pregnant. When he fell on me, two of my ribs popped off of my sternum. Those are the kind of injuries, and what happened to Peyton McNabb has recently happened to another high school athlete in California whose dad is too afraid to say anything. And this cancel culture, what's happened is kids are too afraid to say anything. Parents are too afraid to say anything. Coaches are in massive fear of losing their jobs. Professors are in massive fear of losing all their All for jobs. standing up for women. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Russell. And with that, my time is done. The chair now recognizes Mr. Raskin. 
Thank you kindly, Madam Chair. The, um, the ranking member quoted the Republican governor of Utah who said something to the effect of never before had he seen um, so many be so cruel to so few who just wanted to participate. And Ms. Gosgraves, let me start with you. It sounds to me like what we're mostly talking about here is the women who are at the various, very highest levels of their sport in the final competitions. We're talking about the very best. But do you, do you get complaints about this, or have you heard complaints about this just with people participating in either co-ed sports generally or transgender athletes who are part of an intramural softball league or people playing not for very high stakes, but playing for the reason most of us play, which is to get exercise and have fun. You know, about two dozen states have been racing to try to ban transgender participation in, in sports at all levels. And many of those states have struggled to identify any transgen transgender individuals who are actually playing sports. What we are dealing with right now is not an overwhelming number of transgender athletes in all places, but actually the sort of political rhetoric that is creating this fervor that makes people believe that transgender people who are less than you know, half of 1% of the population um, have an outsized presence in sports. And it's not to protect women's sports. It's not to expand the opportunity for women to play. It's, it's not to bring more resources. Or it, and it's not for school districts to create safer conditions. There are other things that we know that work that increase safety in sports. This is not it. So <clears throat> Ms. Russell, let me ask you, because you're a lacrosse coach. I've got two daughters who've played lacrosse who seem like you're a great coach. Um, Tell us, um, first to answer that question, are we talking about just the highest level of sports where you're identifying a problem? I mean, is it a problem to have co-ed sports or transgender kids playing at a lower level for intramurals and stuff like that? So nobody has here that I've heard has said anything about outlawing transgenders from playing sports. And you don't favor that? No. I, what I am saying personally, and I believe I've heard here, is that I don't believe that biological males should be playing on exclusively women or girls' teams. Co-ed is completely different. When you play co-ed in general, boys and girls know they're playing with each other. It's played differently. It isn't played with the same intensity as a men's sport. Okay, can I just ask about your personal experience, which you alluded to, but you, you ended up losing your job or leaving Oberlin, do I understand it, not because of something that happened with your team or a transgender player on your team, but because of something you said about what happened in another league in another state, is that right? Did, did I follow you? Or just tell me what the story was, I didn't follow. So, I'm sorry, are you asking why I'm no longer coaching there? Yeah, I thought that you were telling us the story of that, but I couldn't quite follow the logical sequence. Can you... <laughs> um, maybe, maybe it's not related to that. I just I thought that it was related to your views on this. So, I told the story publicly, and the college did not... W like what story did you tell, I'm sorry? Of what happened to me at the college when I did speak up about biological males competing against biological females. But was it at Oberlin or it was? No. It was elsewhere. It was elsewhere. So you don't, do you have any direct experience of this, of what you're talking about or no? Of biological males playing at Oberlin with biological females? Yeah, in other words, is that where this comes from or no? No. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so Ms. Gosgraves, let me just come back to you finally. Um, <clears throat> Secretary DeVos in the Trump administration, um, she took the position that transgender kids should not be able to participate, I think, across the board, you know, not just at the highest levels or whatever, but just categorically could not participate. Um, and um, the Office of Civil Rights in May 2020 ruled that a Connecticut high school could not maintain its policy allowing transgender students to participate in athletics on a team corresponding to their gender identity. Um, 
how did that policy, because I understand the policy today is it's up to the schools to decide when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate under the Biden administration rules, but how did that policy of categorically banning it affect children? What a categorical ban means is that a child who wants to play doesn't have the chance to play. It also means that even if you are a transgender kid who maybe you don't even want to play sports, you now have a giant signal coming from your government that you are less worthy, that discrimination against you will be okay. And so it is both the practical harm, but then this broader message that policymakers are sending to young people that is disturbing. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. The, cha the chair now rec recognizes Mr. Gosar for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. As an understanding of fairness is one that we almost instinctively learn from birth. Nothing offends a little child more than a sibling getting a treat, and he or she doesn't. And America really hates cheaters. Just ask Lance Armstrong. Remember Deflate Gate? The uncovery of the steroid era was not kind to baseball. That is why beating women in women's sports is so obnoxious to American public. Not only is allowing men to play in women's sports a flagrant violation of fairness, as well as posing a danger to women in the locker room and the bathrooms, making women feel the opposite of unique, as then anyone can become one, it normalizes and encourages the terrible reality and tragedy of children mutilating themselves in a misguided and hopeless attempt to change genders. The Family Research Council cited the World Professional Association that the transgender help as a source of the following list of awful diseases that cross-sex hormones cause. Here's a list. Blood clots, high triglycerides, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, red, high red blood cells, a destabilization of psycholo some psychological disorders. It defies common sense that mutilation improves mental health. For the love of God to everyone who promotes this terrible ideology, desist. Stop. Every time you claim a man can play a woman's sports, Every time you tell a child that they can be whatever gender you want to be, every time you read a book to a child promoting this propaganda, you are risking the health, happiness, and well-being of our children. Please stop experimenting with our youth. Ms. Gross Graves, I want to ask you a question. Is the genetic composition of a transgender versus a woman the same? No. Well, I'm not a scientist. But well, we're talking science. about science here, so I, mean, I hope you, I, they're I, not the same. So that's why you see all these physiological differences. If I can answer, though, I, I mean, if your question is, um, how do you define woman? A woman is an adult female, but there's a lot of variation that goes beyond my level of high well, school biology. Well, I just biology, want to tell you, you so can't, I, I'm not looking at a definition. I'm talking about the science. The science genetically is a man is a man is a different genetics than women, plain and simple. That's just so what it is. I, I guess what it, I would say is that it is, I'm not a scientist or a doctor, but it is my understanding that it is more complex than what you are saying, in that there is variation among men and among women, and sometimes more variation um, among than there is between. Again, I'm not a scientist, and you know, I, I don't think the panelists are scientists either. It seems like it may be a different scientific hearing that you can. Well, that's why you have the differences. That's why you see muscle mass. That's why you see tidal volume. That's why you see all these right these variations. So, for example, in the WNBA, there's players that are five foot five, and there's players that are um, six foot nine. So let me there's so wide let me, variation. Now, now that you brought that up, let's, let, let, now that you brought that up, let's and, talk about that. So, uh, the, the center for the the Arizona, uh, the Phoenix Mercury, she had to get a genetics test to prove that she was a woman. Did she not? You know what? She did. And it's actually going to the problem with these sorts of sex verification, verification and sex texting. Well. That um, when I think about what all women, but especially uh, black women whose uh, bodies have historically fell outside the sort of typical, what's considered the typical norm, um, the idea that people would have to prove up their femaleness to play, it's horrifying, and it's going in the wrong direction. I don't well, think I, anybody I, wants I, that, I, especially I just, for I, I theoretically friends. disagree with you. I think, I think we've got to be real about, with people, about what, the, what their aspects are. Uh, Riley, how does playing in women's sports affect, how do men playing in women's sports affect the esprit, esprit de corps of a team or the team spirit? Uh, speaking to, again, my lived experience, uh, first and foremost, it was a major distraction to have a male competing with us at that national championships. 
Uh, it was all we could talk about as a team. Uh, we were fearful to go into the locker room. We had to wait and watch if Thomas came out. Then we would enter uh, to avoid going in at the same time. Uh, of course, our sport is very physical, but there is a mental aspect to it. Uh, and allowing men into our sports uh, certainly negatively impacted that mental aspect, as well as the physical, of course. Hmm. Ms. Perry, what are the likely costs to educational institutes of complying with Biden's new Title IX rule, which makes it almost impossible for schools receiving money to limit a women's sports to only women? This isn't just cost to education. This is cost to the federal government and taxpayers. It's cost to the medical community. It's, co it's cost to reduce lunch programs. And that's because Title IX intersects with Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act and the Food and Nutrition Act, which is the USDA's reduced school lunch program. That means that implicating this particular rule doesn't just affect sports. It affects everything from nutrition program funding. It affects the cost of litigation. It affects the cost of implementation. Now we're requiring open locker rooms, open bathrooms as well. The cost of implementation, in addition to what are certain to be personal injury lawsuits, as a result of the fact that these female students are now getting concussions, dental injuries, facial injuries. A school that does not protect its biological girls, maintain sex separate spaces, is certain to going to be facing significant financial harm. Thank you, Ms. Perry. I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Ms. Ocasio-Cortez. Thank you. You know, I've spent a um, decent amount of my time here in Congress sitting through panels and hearings of men attempting to restrict the rights of women and telling us that it's for our own good. Um, but I want to dive a little bit more deeply into why this issue with targeting trans women in sports is particularly problematic, not just for trans girls, but for all of us. We're here today because there's a proposal here and there are several proposals here uh, to further marginalize trans women in sports. And I think about this all the time because trans people in the United States doesn't even exceed 1% of our population. And yet there is so many resources and energy and time dedicated to figuring out how we can more finely exclude them um, from our sports. And I thought, why, why, why so much effort and dedication on such a tiny portion of the US population when there virtually is no major issue that is, um, that is precipitating? And I started to realize that a lot of these proposals here um, involve invasion of privacy of all women. Ms. Goss Graves, can you tell us a little bit about what sex testing looks like for youth in states with trans athletic bans? It, it's terrible. Uh, in some states, any individual could challenge whether someone is a girl enough to play. In some states, it requires actual a genital verification, which is shocking. Mm -hmm. um, and there aren't, it's not as if there, Okay. And let me just stop you right there. You said there are some proposals. I mean, we've seen this in Ohio. There was a proposed ban on trans athletes that originally allowed for genital examinations on minors in order to quote unquote protect women. Is that correct? Unfortunately, yes. And so we're seeing here in this guise, under the guise of not only trying to further marginalize trans women and girls, we are talking about opening up all women and girls to genital examinations when they are under age. That's right. Potentially just because someone can point to someone and say, I don't think you're a girl. That's correct. And we're saying this in an environment of a post Dobbs America where states are criminalizing access to abortion and want nothing more than data on women to figure out when, who's getting a menstrual cycle, who doesn't have one, and we're supposed to believe that this is gonna make us better and safer? I think not. And per usual, 
I don't believe we're sitting here in a panel of men that has actually thought of, about the biology and privacy consequences of all women, trans or cisgender, here. Ms. Gosgraves, in addition to that, are there certain groups more likely to face discrimination under these bans? When well, it comes to, and what, and what you were speaking to, particularly when it comes to black women and girls? Yeah, we, we have seen that there are examples of uh, black women who are even professional athletes whose bodies have been more examined and demonized. We've seen that with my fan favorite, Serena Williams, whose body is often mm -hmm. talked about. Um, that's sort of challenging them for who they are. Uh, if it is codified into law, mm. is something that we would expect to see more. And, and this also deeply intersects with a secondary issue, which is racial bias in the medical field. When we have vast proportions of populations that have been studied and tested are not right racially or otherwise identity-based representative of the broader U.S. population. And so what gets determined as a norm oftentimes gets pegged to largely white populations that have been studied, and then black women and girls are then further subject to, to um, marginalization. This, this has been in your experience and what you've seen as well, right? That's correct. And so we're supposed to sit here on this side of the dais and to the ranking member, to ranking member Lee's point, see a, a party that has voted against women's access to abortion, voted against our right, the Lilly Ledbetter Equal Pay Act, voted against the Violence Against Women Act, voted against our right to have access to contraception, and also doesn't even vote for equal funding, equitable funding in women's sports. And I'm supposed to believe that this is who's looking out for my best interests? I think not. And to that, I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman. Yeah. Um, second hearing I've been at today. Earlier today, we had a hearing uh, on anti-Semitism on campuses. The only th they, but they, they kind of flow together because both show the complete lack of common sense of the people running our universities today. So two different hearings, but we get the same thing out of it. Um, I, I'm going to start with Ms. Gaines. Uh, you would participated in a small group that I was, I was with earlier. And I learned something kind of out of this. Uh, this whole thing is kind of based on the idea that, you know, people are one way or the other. Uh, as I understand it, is it true that if people go all the way in transgender that, um, that they still have to take hormones? That they really, you know, like if a, if a, if a boy becomes a gal, uh, he still has to, he, he doesn't become a gal all the way. He still has to take hormones to deal with this. Uh, so different governing bodies of different sports have different rules. Uh, so for example, FINA, which is the international governing body of swimming, now has implemented a rule that says uh, if you've gone through male puberty, you cannot compete with women. But then you have other sports, such as soccer, uh, that says you can have, it's a testosterone threshold. So I think, I believe now it's 10 nanomoles per liter of testosterone uh, any person, male, female, can possess and still be allowed to play on the women's team. So it varies by sport, but specifically the NCAA, uh, they had a, a blanket policy in 2010 that just said 12 months of HRT, which of course is hormone replacement therapy. One thing I always wonder about this, and I'll ask Ms. Perry, and if you don't have an answer, that, that's okay. Um, I, as I understand it from what I've read, the vast majority of people, 80 to 95 percent, who go what they call discordant gender identity, eventually come back to their original gender. And I sometimes wonder, as we normalize this idea of guys playing in women's sports, are you kind of creating a situation which would be tragic if it's true, that, that, that some of these guys are now never going to switch back because their whole social setting is praising them for for switching, and I, I think it would be just kind of too bad if they would have been the 80 or 95 percent at snap back, but because of this, they won't. Do you think that's a concern, Ms. Perry? I think absolutely it's a concern. In fact, studies show that 75 to 90 percent of children, if they are allowed to through 
75 to 90 percent of children, if allowed to progress through normal puberty, eventually make peace with their natal biological sex and avoid the trans dilemma altogether. We also know, based on studies, that social transitioning, including playing on a team specifically articulated by the Biden administration in its notice of proposed, proposed rulemaking, playing on the team that you want specifically for your gender identity, not based on sex, is an entree into ultimate medical transitioning. Now, with the rise of detransitioners, which we've seen in widespread formats, including out in California, where Kaiser Permanente is subject to multiple lawsuits for fast-tracking gender identitarian surgeries, the mind reels at what the implications um, are going to be. I, I did read that these people are 19 more, times more likely than the rest of the public commit suicide. You mean by uh, encouraging these kids to play on an athletic team that doesn't match their actual sex? you may be sending them down this path in which they might wind up killing themselves? Absolutely. In addition to using cross-sex hormones or puberty blockers, that actually sets off many latent medical health, mental health conditions that may not have been previously diagnosed. A full 30% in America of young women who are presenting to a gender confirmation clinic have not been diagnosed but are ultimately diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. As the mother of two children on the autism spectrum disorder scale, I will tell you right now, they are very, very obvious manifestations that someone not trained to look for would have to take into account rather than fast-tracking someone into medical and hormonal castration. Well, this is really interesting. I mean, I would say it's one thing if you're dealing with 30 or 35-year-olds, but we're here largely dealing with people who are so young you know, 14, 15 years old, and you wind up, you're kind of pushing them towards, uh, towards transitioning and, and maybe screwing up their whole life. Is that true? No question. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, and I'll... Thank you, Mr. Grofman. The chair now recognizes Ms. Crockett from Texas. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So... Most everyone up here on the other side of the aisle has endorsed a person um, that has been found liable for sexual abuse of women um, to be our president of the United States. But we are going to talk about how this party is going to protect women. Protecting women, what exactly does that mean? Are we going to talk about sexual abuse? Because we can get into it, because we do have some real conversations that we can have about it. Considering the fact that we're currently in the middle of, say, a war, there's been allegations of rape being used in war, seems like maybe we could have a few conversations about what it would look like to prevent that, what it would look like to maybe go and get those hostages out, maybe go and send some money to our allies. It looks like we could do something of value, but let me tell you, this session, we have set so many good records. One of those records was we've had a record number of people that have retired or announced their retirements in the month of November from the House. And from everything that I hear, it's because this body has become completely unserious. But we do have serious issues, especially when it comes to women. So let's talk about what it looks like to protect women in this country. When lawmakers like this are so far out of touch with what women need, we see states pushing back, at least states that will allow you to push back. I'm from the state of Texas, and of course, they don't want you to ever have an opportunity to raise your voice in the state of Texas. In fact, Ms. Perry, I know your organization, the Heritage Foundation, loves Texas. Ooh, they love Texas. They always sending us some nonsense bills um, that somehow set this country on the wrong trajectory. They send them to Texas. They send them to Florida. Every deplorable state that we can think about, they usually come in out of y'all's think tank. But nevertheless... When we talk about protecting women, what we've seen is, say, in the state of Ohio was one of the most recent states when their lawmakers didn't have the courage to do what they needed to do because, of course, we believe Point in gerrymandering. And because we believe Point in of order. gerrymandering in this. Point of order. I, I moved Please to strike stop my her time. Word. I moved to strike her words, deplorable states. That's not a point of order. Let the gentlelady proceed. I the committee will suspend. Whoa, 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 whoa. The committee will suspend. Just hold, slow. What do I? Oh, I don't even know. 
I'm going to say that name wrong. <laughs> Maybe states have personhood. So I'm prepared to rule. Um, this is not a statement, a deplorable state is not a statement again against a person, um, or it is not engaging in personalities. So I'll continue and you can reclaim your time. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we saw recently what the state of Ohio did when their lawmakers refused to listen to them. We also have seen what the state of Kansas decided to do. When it comes to protecting women, it seems like the only people that are standing up for women on an everyday basis are the people themselves because they're elected officials that somehow get into these positions in a gerrymandered way. They don't seem to represent the interest of the people. But let me talk to you about something that is very real in this country, and that is unhoused people. And I'm sure that while we don't have an expert on the matter here, many of you may not recognize that the majority of the youth that are actually unhoused in this country are members of the LGBTQIA community. When we look at mental health issues in this country, if we care, because I didn't heard terms that I never thought I heard hear certain people say up in here. Uh, we didn't heard about equality. We didn't heard about regressiveness. We've heard about civil rights. I, I can't get the Voting Rights Act passed. Uh, we've heard we need to follow the science. Are you kidding me? When we're sitting up here talking about anti-vaccine and all this nonsense. But let me tell you about somebody that I love very dearly who has struggled and suffered because of the ignorance that continues to be perpetuated, which is not what is in the will of the people. Young Libby, who has been my constituent for far too long and gone through too much in the state of Texas. At the age of seven, Libby started testifying down at the state house about the bathroom bill. I think that was a Heritage Foundation situation as well. Started testifying at the age of seven about how it made her feel. Then ultimately, Libby has been testifying and at this point, Libby is 13 years old. And I'm gonna tell you something. I know that it was characterized as, oh, this is the cool thing to do, and maybe uh, people are encouraged to be trans, and so they don't want to speak out, and all that. It is not the easy thing to do when you have to sit here and prove your personhood every single time that you're walking around. You got people that feel a way because they losing in the sport. And listen, the, the, the trans person, it don't sound like even came in first from what I could tell, but nevertheless, I think we need to focus on real things that are real issues as it relates to women. If you care about women, let's get the ERA passed so we can have equal rights. Let's make sure that we fully fund access to reproductive health. Let's make sure that we are protecting those that are being raped because they're being raped in this country as well as abroad. And this party has decided that even if you're raped and you're a child, guess what? You shouldn't have access to reproductive health care. That is not protecting women and I will yield. Thank you. Before this gets even more out of control, <laughs> I'm going to try and reel it back in. I'm going to remind everybody on what the title of this hearing is. The importance of protecting female athletes and Title IX. So Title IX was designed to give female athletes equality, fairness. This is about, and I'm going to restate it again because we're getting off track, Title IX and protecting female athletes. I'm happy to have other hearings, but I'd like to stay focused on this hearing, if we could, which again is the importance of protecting female athletes in Title IX. And with that, um, Without objection, Repres Representative Takano of California is waived onto the subcommittee for purposes of questioning the witness at today's subcommittee hearing. And with that, Mr. Burleson is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chairwoman, for holding this hearing. I think this is an extremely important topic. Um, what's, I, and I want to 
reiterate the words of our colleague from Wisconsin. What's happening in our universities is insane. Uh, it's almost a de-evolution of thought that, is, that has occurred in Western culture for thousands of years um, uh, from, political philosopher, from philosophers like Plato to Descartes to Bacon, that, that what's in your mind is not necessarily reality and the truth. And you can believe all day long in one thing. It doesn't mean it, that it's so. And so it's almost like our, our, this, this nation and this, and this attitude that we want to we throw out all of this conventional thinking for, for centuries is really going to be the undoing of this nation. Um, but if you want to know where this administration stands, all you have to do is look at the position statement um, from President Biden. He said, and I quote, let's be clear, transgender equality is the civil rights issue of our time. There's no room for com compromise when it comes to basic human rights. There's no room for compromise? That's pretty, that's a very definitive statement. Um, Mrs. Gaines, wh what would you say to those that claim that there's no room for compromise when it comes to men competing in women's sports? That statement, um, I'm just, truthfully, I'm not even honestly sure what that would entail. In terms of compromise from women, uh, I don't believe we should have to compromise anything. Uh, we should be, and this is what Title IX's original intent was, uh, we should be entitled to competing on the basis of sex and without facing discrimination. But again, what myself and my teammates and my competitors and girls around the country, high school level, college level, continue to face is blatant discrimination on the basis of our sex. Yeah, I can tell you, I'm a father of two girls who both participated in sports. And I'll tell you, when you're the parent on the sidelines and you're watching, you, the competitive, you know, every, all that nature flows. And when you see an injustice occur, you know, whether it's, teams that are having children that are older than your kids, you know, being playing, or in the, and sometimes I will never forget, for, for many years, boys and girls were equal, especially in soccer, right, which my girls competed in. But there was a point in which it was no longer the case. And as a parent, and all the parents on the sidelines, we would actually count the number, especially in, still in co-ed, we would count the number of boys and determine that's, you know, which team is probably going to win. And, there, and so it was nice whenever they were able to actually hit an age where they were able to compete against other girls and other women. Um, but sadly, this, that's why everybody who sees what's happening knows that this is injustice. Anyone who is a parent who sees what's happening knows this, that this is an injustice. In fact, a survey of parents in the United States concluded that 70% of parents do not think that this is a good idea, and yet we're doing it, and so, or, or that it's being done at our university levels. Um, and of course, if you object, you're considered trans, you know, transgressive or transphobic, um, and you're effectively canceled. Mrs. Russell, you were effectively canceled for standing up for female athletes on your team. What would you say to others in a similar position who are wondering whether or not they should speak out? I would still suggest that everybody speak up because it's because of silence that this continues. Um, there are, the amount of support I received once I went public, um, the number of emails, direct messages, phone calls, all was positive. Everything on social media was positive in support of this position that girls and women's sports needs to stay female only. Well, Ms. Russell, thank you for your courageous stand. I, we, appreciate, we appreciate that. I, I just want to say, you know, to, to Mrs. Gaines, what happened to you was, is tragic. I mean, the, what, you were robbed of your, the glory, you were robbed of your opportunity to, um, to be clearly the victor. And it's, if, if it weren't so tragic, it would be comical. I mean, and I understand there's a movie being made, the comedy about this very issue um, that on the Daily Wire that I can't wait to see. I encourage everyone to watch it. Um, and truthfully, I think that's what's needed uh, because what we're seeing, again, what myself and my teammates and my competitors saw was a mockery, a mockery of women, 
Uh, and I believe it's time we mock the mockery through comedy, because you're right, it's objectively funny. Uh, it's inherent to, to almost look at this and laugh because it feels like satire. Uh, but watching that movie, uh, to which I watched, uh, it didn't feel like satire, it felt like a documentary of what, again, myself and girls around the country continue to go through. Thank you, my time has expired. Thank you, the chair now recognizes Mr. Ticano for five minutes. I thank the chair and I thank the committee for the opportunity to participate. Um, you know, uh, Ms. Russell, um, uh, these numbers, I'll try to get the substantiation somewhere, but um, men in this country, uh, inter interscholastically, receive two, uh, $252 million more in athletic scholarships than women uh, for the 2019-2020 uh, year. And, and girls generally have approximately 1.1 million fewer opportunities than boys to participate in high school athletics. Um, Title IX has not been able to fix that. Um, and does, this seem, does this ring true, uh, th that, the statistic I just read to you? I don't have the statistic in front of me, but what I do know is that there are so many more opportunities because of Title IX, and if we allow men and boys into women's Thank sports, which is what is happening, Russell, then I those just, opportunities I just and more scholarships to whether or not, go away for well, women. I don't know whether or not excluding transgender athletes from participating fixes this gross in in inequity of two, $252 million more in athletic scholarships for women and 1.1 million fewer opportunities for uh, girls than boys to participate in high school athletics. My point is that excluding transgender athletes who constitute less than 1% of this country is not a fix to the gender inequities uh, in sports. Um, I, let me just uh, read to you. Am I allowed to uh, say something? No, I, I, no I'm, I'm reclaiming my time. Um, I want to read to you uh, a, an expert of the veto message from Governor Spencer Cox of Utah when he vetoed the trans ban in sports. He said, uh, there's, he, he reads this final reason for this veto. He says, I must admit I'm not an expert in transgenderism. I struggle to understand much of it and the science is conflicting. When in doubt, however, I always try to err on the side of kindness, mercy, and compassion. I also try to get proximate and I'm learning so much more so much, so much from our transgender community. They are great kids who face enormous struggles. And here are the numbers that have most impacted my decision. 75,000, four, one, 86, and 56. 75,000 high school kids participating in high school sports in Utah. Four transgender kids playing high school sports in Utah. One transgender student playing girls sports. 86% of trans students reporting suicidality. 56% of trans youth having attempted suicide. Four kids and only one of them playing girl sports. That's what all this is about. Four kids who aren't dominating or winning trophies or taking scholarships. Four kids who are just trying to find some friends and feel like they're part of something. Four kids trying to get through each day. Rarely has so much fear and anger been directed at so few. I don't understand what they are going through or why they feel the way they do, but I want them to live. And all the research shows that even a little acceptance and connection can reduce suicidality significantly. And for that reason, as much as any other, I have taken this action, meaning to veto this bill, and hope that we can continue to work together and find a better way. If a veto ride over occurs, I hope we can work to find ways to show these four kids that we love them that they have a place in our state. I, I find that remarkable. Now, following, following that veto and following the override, it was interesting because there was an incident in Utah where parents um, perceived that the winner of a contest, uh, of an athletic contest, was really not uh, of that gender, was not really a girl. And so what happened is the parents forced this woman, this young, this young girl, to undergo a genital inspection because her body type didn't conform to uh, that of what they thought was a, a, a girl and, and feminine. Um, and um, I just want to insert um, 
this article, you know, judge blocks Utah trans sports ban while probe of athlete emerges into the record. I also want to, would like to, unanimous you know, consent to enter into the record uh, the veto message of President, uh, of, uh, of Spencer Cox of Utah, the governor of Utah. Without um, objection. Um, uh, Ms. Goss Graves, uh, I mean, you cited earlier this issue of straight girls who win being subjected potentially to this invasion of privacy. That's correct. All girls are subject to these sorts of sex verification processes, whether it be the abusive genital um, examinations or tracking menstrual cycles or other sorts of deep invasions of privacy. But I think who will be most harmed by that actually are the girls who don't generally fit a stereotype. And there's been a lot of stereotype conversation today. Lots of people fit a stereotype and lots of people don't conform to stereotypes. Types. And Title IX for 50 years has had something to say about that. Thank you. I'm sorry for going over, Madam Chair. I'll back. Thank you. Ms. Russell, I'll give you a few seconds to respond. Um, this is the second time I've heard in here exclusion of transgender athletes. We are not talking about excluding anyone. We are talking about keeping female sports for biological females only. Women's and girls sports for biological females only. That does not exclude anyone. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Ms. Fox, Chairman Fox, for uh, five minutes. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Russell, I'd like to continue um, on this issue. Um, in terms of uh, what Mr. Takana was saying, my understanding is along your line, it's not just, and it's not a matter of, of uh, it, it's not just a matter of people who pretend to be girls or women who, who are biological males moving into girls and women's sports to take a place, but isn't there an issue of the difference in strength and the issue of safety? Aren't those primary issues with saying biological men should not be competing against biological women? You are correct. So even if um, a biological male is on puberty blockers, I mean, sorry, um, testosterone blockers, um, they can still maintain their muscle mass with their workouts. Um, as far as the safety, Right now, we just talked about uh, three different high school athletes who've been injured by biological males. One of those biological males is not transgender. Um, and the speed of the shot that he took that hit the girl in the mouth in field hockey, uh, if you don't know what a field hockey ball looks like, it, it's uh, harder than a baseball um, and harder than a lacrosse ball. Um, the, the muscle mass in men, it's not just that, it's the body composition. The hips are thinner. They aren't made to give birth to right. children. Right. Um, they aren't made to breastfeed children. Thank, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Gaines, uh, thank you very much for the great work that you're doing in, in bringing this issue, keeping this issue in the forefront of people's um, minds. The lack of transparency provided by the Biden administration about changes to Title IX and other aspects of their social agenda is concerning, particularly for parents. Ms. Gaines, how did your parents find out you would be changing clothes in the same locker room as a biological male? Well, I had to call my parents. Uh, Tell them. As mentioned in my testimony, we were not forewarned. We would be sharing a changing space the only time, the first time, we became aware we would be forced to undress next to, again, this six foot four, 22 year old male fully intact with and exposing male genitalia was when we were inches away from this male also simultaneously undressing. And I'll tell you, I called my parents, uh, specifically my dad, uh, and he was outraged. And so no one was informed about this ahead of time. Um, what are your former teammates? I'm sure you've been, in front, been around them. How are they responding to these sweeping changes in women's sports? Being team captain at University of Kentucky, both my junior and senior year, uh, I made sure to facilitate an environment where everyone felt comfortable sharing their views. Uh, and what I noticed was 38 out of the 40 girls on the women's swimming and diving team uh, felt the exact same way I'm sharing with you. Uh, and again, I don't claim to speak for every single girl, 
but I do claim to speak for the overwhelming majority of us because I saw the tears uh, from the girls who, of course, placed ninth and 17th and missed out on being named an All-American by one place, and I felt the extreme discomfort, uh, and I can attest to the whispers of anger and frustration from those girls who, just like myself, had worked our entire lives to get to that point. Thank you. Ms. Perry, what impact do you believe the Biden administration's attempts to change Title IX will have in parental involvement in women's sports? And how important is parental involvement? Why should we protect it? Well, this administration is keen to divest parents of their constitutional authority to oversee the care and upbringing of their children at every turn. And the rise in what we've seen of these confidential gender identity policies and publicly funded schools is a perfect example of that. Divesting parents from their ability to be involved in the children sports, the competitive nature of what will ultimately invest them going forward with the maturity and the success that they'll need later in life, I don't think just involves parents, I think ultimately involves a disservice to teachers, to educators, to school administrators. And the fact of the matter is just the second of these two rules is patently unconstitutional and won't survive a legal challenge. Ms. Perry, in their April 13th proposed rule, the Biden administration uses the Bostock versus Clayton County ruling as justification. What is the Biden administration's error in using this rule? It's hard to contain it into a very brief statement, but I will say that the opinion began with Justice Gorsuch writing, we begin with the assumption that sex means biological distinctions between male and female. At no point was sex expanded to include gender identity. Title IX and Title VII are completely different. Title VII, which was at issue in Bostock, is an employment law that prevents consideration at all of underlying sex or sex characteristics. Title IX, however, is exactly the opposite. It requires consideration of sex. And because Gorsuch was clear to cabin the opinion, saying exclusively, we are not talking about anything but employment discrimination law, we are not discussing pronouns, bathrooms, dress codes, or locker rooms, that unfortunately was not a message I think the Department of Education was Thank keen to listen to, so they patently Thank ignored it. Thank you, Thank, Ms. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Um, I, I want to make one clarification that the ranking member uh, of the full committee made. Um, our current Title IX rule in no way prevents transgender students from participating in sports. It simply said a school didn't violate Title IX by having them compete based on their biological sex. So I just want to clarify that for the record. Um, and since I gave Ms. Russell um, a few extra minutes, I will tack that time on to you, Mr. Kassar. So I... Madam Chair, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record this study by the British Journal of Sports Medicine showing that after two years of hormone therapy, most athletic performance differences between trans women and cis women disappear, challenging what we've heard today that would have you think all trans women are so physically superior to cisgender women that they are bound to win every match and injure all opponents along the way. This narrative is not supported by science. Without objection, so ordered. Um, with that, the chair now recognizes Ms. Mr. Kassar for five ish minutes. Thank you, Chair. I want to take a step back and think about the big picture of what we've been talking about in this committee hearing when we talk about trans youth participating in sports. Because when we're here at the seat of government in the U.S. Capitol and we talk about young people, I think we should be talking about how we support them. And if anyone needs support, it's probably trans youth who are more likely to have faced bullying and isolation and doubt and usually have a harder time than most of our kids. But instead of talking about how to support all of our youth, especially our most vulnerable youth, people in my state, like Greg Abbott, have used their government power to pick on trans kids and get TV news hits about those kids' ability to play in sports. And instead of funding schools, supporting teachers or counselors or youth programs. I've got an extremist legislature singling out what we've been talking about today, a small handful of kids who are already suffering from pain with more pain. Because those families that I've met with and talked about, they know that when we spend our time in these seats of power, 
talking about them instead of with them about these challenges, that creates even worse mental health issues, even more just really hard times for some of these families who are now questioning their own residency in my state. That's what we're dealing with here today. And so like any other athlete, trans athletes sometimes win, sometimes they lose, but in talking with a very small handful of them, they talk about how this is a chance at camaraderie, this is a chance at relaxation, this is a chance at teamwork. And so in my view, instead of spending our time picking on trans youth, we should be listening to them, bringing community together, figuring out how to solve the real challenges that our youth face, rather than angling for the latest segment on Fox News. We should be focused on expanding opportunities for all of our young people and find ways to let kids be kids. So now for my questions, Ms. Goss Graves, are you aware of any reason to believe that allowing trans athletes to participate in girls' athletics is limiting opportunities for cisgender athletes? Uh, absolutely not. In fact, there's a lot of gender inequity in sports and in schools. The trans athletes are not the source of it. They aren't the source of resource inequity. They aren't the source of not having the same level of coaching. They aren't the source of not opening up new sports teams when you have a group of girls who say, I just want to try playing lacrosse and your school won't start a lacrosse team. Trans athletes are not the reason that we have gender inequity in sports, and they are not the reason that 50 years after Title IX was passed, its broad promise of addressing sex discrimination in education is still unfulfilled. Thank you for that answer. And so, Ms. Goss Graves, how could we, since we're in these seats of power, better support women's athletics and increase opportunities for girls and women who want to participate in sports? There's a range of things that would be important. You could provide additional resources to schools, especially schools who are, have fewer resources to devote to sports. Oftentimes what we have found in areas uh, where they have fewer resources, what they end up doing is investing hugely into male sports programs and deciding that they're not gonna invest in, in female sports programs. You could also take action on uh, the, the information that has come out about sexual abuse in sports. Abuse by coaches, by athletic trainers, by sometimes medical doctors. This isn't uh, something that's coming out about trans athletes. It is about schools looking away from the harm that their employees are causing. There are a range of things I'd be happy to work with you and with this committee on it. So as Mr. Takano mentioned, the, the four trans athletes in Utah, it's not them that were caused uh, the huge disproportionality in funding for men's sports versus women's sports. In fact, what you're saying here is it may not be trans athletes or isn't trans athletes taking opportunities away from women's sports. It might actually be guys like us on dioceses like this one not investing equally in women's sports. Um, actually, I have here an example from the Women's Sports Foundation saying that men received $252 million more in athletic scholarships than women in the years 2019 and 2020. Uh, a report released last year for the 50th anniversary of Title IX found that men's athletic programs received more than twice as many resources as women's athletic programs in 2020, and expenditures for recruiting and compensating head and assistant coaches favored male athletes about three to one. So I wanna enter both of those documents into the record. First, the May 2022 report from the Women's Sports Foundation Title 50 years of Title IX, we're not done yet, um, so I'd like unanimous consent to enter that into the record, along with this report from 2022 from the NCAA, titled The State of Women in College Sports. Thank you. So, I think that this is a really important part of the question. One, how can we better support young people in general? And then second, if the claim is that by supporting trans young people and their mental health and their ability to be fully included in themselves were hurting women's sports, then we'll actually ask ourselves what is actually hurting women's sports. And it might be uh, the amount of scholarship money that many of us who were male athletes immediately had access to that women athletes didn't have access to, or the fact that many of us who were male athletes could participate in sports over the summer and in the fall semester and in the spring semester and do a second set of sports and that you already had your 
uh, uniforms paid for and you already had the ability to get state championships uh, trips paid for, maybe we could be talking about those things if we're going to be talking about sports. Um, Ms. Goss Graves, just to close here, how can bans on trans athletes participating in girls or women's athletics actually also harm those cis students? Well, we've talked a lot about the sort of sex verification that we have seen, um, and that is how you prove, how states are requiring proving up that you are girl enough or woman enough to play. But I also just want to say this has been studied. The issue of trans exclusionary policies, sports participation for girls overall in high school declined in states that had trans exclusion policies. So when we are inclusive, everyone wins. Wait, so you're saying where there have been more trans inclusive policies, you've actually had more women participate That's in sports correct. in those days? That is correct. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for the purposes of asking questions. You know, what's interesting about this entire debate, we dealt with this in South Carolina when I was in the General Assembly. It shocked me, the polling, when you look at this, the amount of people that support keeping girls in girls' sports and men in men's sports. 70% around the country. The American people can't agree 70% on anything. But on this, they are there. They understand it. And it, it makes common sense. And so, Ms. Gaines, when you travel the country, what are some of the things, the stories that you hear from women who uh, are seeing this on the, in their schools and on their campuses? Well, first and foremost, to, to, to your point, uh, as we see a lot of times, both at the state and federal level, uh, how representatives vote, senators vote, delegates vote, uh, how we see the media portray this issue, it seems as if it falls on party lines. But just as you said, that could not be further from the truth. This extends beyond the political aisle. Uh, and that's certainly something I've seen uh, traveling the country, going state to state, talking to, to women who have been impacted by this in some capacity, whether that be in their sport, whether that be women in prisons who have dealt with, with men, male inmates being allowed into their prisons, whether that be, again, the, the case of the sorority in Wyoming, whatever the situation might be, bathroom instances. Uh, as we saw uh, this week, a headline about a male who was allowed to sleep in a, in a bed, be roomed with a woman. Uh, and the answer is always the same thing, and that this is harmful specifically to women. It adversely affects women. Uh, again, this whole hearing, we haven't talked about females entering into men's sport because that's not a threat and it's not happening and it won't happen because this is only happening one way and that way is the way that affects women negatively. Right, and so you look at the polling on this and then we just talked about this, but it's, it's, it's remarkable to me. I mean, this is the success of Title IX. When you have you know, roughly 300,000 at the start in 1972 female athletes and now you're over three million, people understand what is going on. Your parents understood what was happening in your locker room. They understand what's going on. That's why they're so supportive of keeping a fair playing field and supporting Title IX in its original intent. What are some of the, the concerns, and maybe not the specific instances, but maybe some of the themes that you hear from women across the country? Uh, well, one, as we've mentioned, safety aspects, especially in sports that require physical contact uh, or throwing something at one another or collision. Uh, these girls are scared. Um, another th thing I hear across the country uh, is women are terrified to speak out. Uh, they're terrified to be vilified. They're terrified to be called transphobic uh, or bigots like we've been called in, in this hearing today for, for stating our views. Uh, and that's a real threat. And I understand it because since taking the stance that I've taken, my address has been leaked. And since my address was leaked, I've had people showing up at my doorstep. I've had drones flying above my house. Uh, I can't even tell you the amount of death threats that I've had that have uh, me rendered the FBI getting involved. Uh, it's real. The vitriol I've faced, I've been held for ransom for over four hours where these protesters demanded that if I wanted to make it home to see my family safely again, I had to pay them money. Uh, I've been hit, I've been spit on, I've had bottles thrown at me, drinks poured on me. Uh, again, uh, Thomas's teammates in particular, they were forced every single week to go to mandatory LGBTQ education meetings to learn about how just by being cisgender, they were oppressing Thomas. And when they were concerned about the locker room aspect, and 16 of these swimmers, Thomas's teammates, sent an email to their administration with their parents on the email, expressing their discomfort in the locker room, the administration responded back with, if you feel uncomfortable seeing male genitalia, here are some counseling resources that you should seek in an attempt to re-educate yourself. 
uh, at in, Roanoke in College. Of, in, what? in light of the time, Ms. Gaines, just yeah. real quickly, um, I, I know that the locker room situation that you described earlier, do you think that the NCAA is actually do, working to improve this situation, or is it kind of status quo with them and sweeping it under the rug? Uh, it's certainly status quo. Uh, President Charlie Baker testified in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee a few weeks ago, and when confronted with that exact question, you know, what does this policy pertaining to the locker rooms look like right now, he couldn't answer. He didn't know what the policy was. He had to tell Senator Hawley, well, let me get back to you in writing. And I think that's incredibly telling for the NCAA president to not even know the policy as it stands pertaining to locker rooms. Ms. Perry, um, you described uh, that the federal government is perpetuating an athletic fraud of unprecedented proportions on students. Um, do you think, uh, one, that the Biden administration's efforts will actually leave a, a lasting impact on women's sports? And, and a follow-up with that, do you hope to see a different approach in a different administration? I think the best and different approach would be to leave Title IX alone. And it, as it was originally intended to be interpreted, there was no ambiguity whatsoever in the definition of sex. And ultimately, what keeps us here is our failure to identify biological distinctions between one sex and another. We can use terms like cis or trans all we want, but men and women are different. And the American public knows it, which is why 70% of the American populace wants sports separated by sex. Washington Post, Harvard Harris, Rasmussen reports, all of them across the line, no matter their ideological bent, all indicate that Americans want sex separated sports. I do have a very strong feeling that this law will automatically be challenged in a federal court. We know that the notice of interpretive guidance has already been seized. It is already now based on 20 states. It is in a holding pattern based on the ultimate release of this final rule. It's a violation of administrative law, civil rights law, and constitutional law. And the ways to challenge it are too long, I think, for the time frame of this hearing today. Thank you for that, Ms. Perry. And with that, I recognize Mr. Garcia of California for five minutes. Very quickly, Mr. Chair, I'd like to seek unanimous consent to enter into the record a court decision from the District Court of Utah and Roe v. Utah High School Athletics Associate, Activities Association. Excuse me. My colleagues have asserted that their proposed interpretation of Title IX would not prevent trans kids from participating in sports. But as the Utah District Court acknowledged in Roe v. Utah High School, activities associated regarding trans girls on, trans, on girls' sports teams, quote, if they are not eligible to play on girls' teams, they have no meaning meaningful opportunity to play at all. Without objection, Mr. Garcia, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, allowing me to wave on this hearing today. I think it's important to have different perspectives. And certainly, uh, before my time uh, being here in Congress for this last year, I served as a mayor of my community. But before that, most importantly, I worked for 10 years on a college campus. And so I understand very well um, what uh, the experience of, of my former students have had and, and what uh, being an athlete and having those experiences also means uh, for so many students. Uh, let me also just say that the advancement for, uh, for women in sports and athletes has been incredible, of course, over the last few decades. And I've seen even my own institution, the university where I worked at, um, the ability to transition and encourage women, uh, women's sports, to fund sports in a, in a, in a way that's equitable for all of our students uh, has always been really important. And so I. I celebrate in advance um, how far um, women athletes have come and sports for, uh, for women across our university systems and community colleges has been is really something to celebrate. I, I also think it's important as an openly gay person uh, to recognize that our community, especially trans people in our community, are constantly being attacked. And I know that some folks have said uh, that or being called um, bigots or fear, the fear there is bigotry, but there is a lot of bigotry, particularly against people that are trans in this country and against the LGBTQ plus community. What the rest of us, like myself as an openly gay person, gay man, face is nothing compared to what transgender people face in this country. And our community needs to be divided, and we cannot be divided amongst ourselves uh, when this hateful kind of vile language happened to so many um, that are already suffering from severe challenges and disadvantages in this country. Now, we know that the subcommittee is tasked with oversight of our federal health care policy, food and drug safety, and monetary policy. All important things, but instead, of course, we're focused on the cruelty towards LGBTQ plus people at the federal level. Now, our voters have sent, here, sent us here to address our country's biggest challenges, 
but instead we are once again going into battles and trying to move our rights backwards, not forward. We know that the majority oftentimes relate, goes back to moral panic and inciting what I believe is violence and hatred towards gay people, and we've seen this playbook over and over again. Now, sports need to remain a place where all LGBTQ plus people can feel free to play and to be accepted. We also know that LGBTQ plus people are underrepresented in sports, and particularly trans and non-binary athletes. There are fewer, by the way, than 100 trans and non-binary athletes in NCAA sports out of over a quarter of a million athletes. So the 226,000 athletes that participate, we're talking about less than 100 actual people. And I want to remind us that there are less than 1% of people identify as trans in the United States. When you look at the whole population, I believe it's 0.4 or 0.5% identify as trans. So what we're really talking about here is a very small percentage of the population that are constantly being attacked and attacked and attacked over and over again. And we know that for trans people, their lives are already in danger in so many ways around mental health challenges and access to health care. Now, Ms. Gosgraves, is there any reason to think that people are transitioning, often com completely radically changing their life and their health just to gain a competitive advantage in women's sports? There's absolutely no evidence of that. And, and actually putting that notion out there in a formal setting with, with policymakers sends a really terrible message. If I could just say one thing about what I hope transgender young people who may be watching this hearing know. And, and that is the sort of legislative bullying that they may experience in their states, or they may have heard in these halls, is not where the majority of the people in this country are. In fact, the vast majority of people see right through it and don't like that bullying. And I, I agree with you. And you, you may or may not know this, but there are more Republican and far-right bills moving through legislatures and through different uh, bodies across the country, then they're actually trans kids and youth playing in sports across, across the country. So the, the attacks that are happening, um, we, should be, we should be ashamed of. And as a reminder, as I conclude, half of trans and non-binary youth struggle with thoughts of suicide every single year, and that's what this hearing should be about versus the attacks on trans athletes. I yield back. Again. This is a hearing about women, protecting women, and protecting Title IX. It's not against any group. But with that, I recognize Mr. Langworthy for five minutes. Thank you, Chair McLean, for holding this hearing. And I can't believe that I have to say this here today, but biological males competing in women's sports is fundamentally unfair. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle time and again tell us to follow and trust the science, yet we are here having to have a debate on a subject in which science has proven definitively that males have a physiological advantage over women, including body size, greater muscle mass, increased lung capacity, larger hearts, bone density, and mass, and less body fat. Uh, these differences create significant performance gaps between post-pubescent males and females, and these are the facts, and those who claim otherwise are threatening the integrity of Title IX and the ability of women to compete on an equal playing field. Uh, the Department of Education's proposed rule conflates sex with gender identity and blocks schools from adopting and enforcing policies that altogether ban transgender students uh, competing on teams consistent with their gender identity. This move sacrifices the integrity of sports, denying the importance of maintaining a level playing field for all athletes. Uh, Ms. Perry, you previously wrote that rather than clarifying Title IX's application to sex-based criteria in athletics, that this proposed rule complicates it. Could you elaborate on that? It makes something that was previously very cut and dry, very simple, and for which there are five decades of jurisprudence and congressional history, and suddenly likes to pretend that we don't understand what this definition of sex was. In fact, this took, this particular law that we discussed today, was the result of 250 different versions between House and Senate 
bills and months and months of negotiation. So to say that somehow sex, when it was adopted, was somehow ambiguous, ambiguous is just patently untrue. So what we've seen, even after Title IX was amended in 18, 1987 with the uh, Civil Rights uh, Review Act, R Restoration Act, there was specifically an opportunity to again go back to the drawing board to expand the definition of sex, to include gender identity. This is about, at bottom, the rule of law, the Constitution, and congressional authority. The Biden administration cannot, with a stroke of a pen, unilaterally redefine longstanding federal law without going through the appropriate process. Thank you. And Ms. Gaines, your profound dedication to sports, including your tenure as a swimmer at Kentucky's uh, women's teams, it speaks volumes. Uh, given your extensive experience, do you fear that if the Biden administration redefines Title IX to encompass gender identity, that it might deprive young women of academic and athletic prospects that they rightfully deserve? Of course. Uh, as we've seen, again, at, the, at least the past year and a half since I've, I've really started noticing this issue after I was directly impacted by it, uh, we're seeing this as a trend, and it's an exponential trend, and again, only going one way, uh, and that is adversely affecting women. So I believe if the Biden administration uh, pursues this rewrite and equates sex with gender identity, uh, this would most certainly negatively harm women. And as per the Washington Post, women's sports have seen an incredible surge growing over 1,000% in the last 50 years, and as many have said, 3 million participants uh, in 2022. Do you share the concerns that allowing biological men to dominate women's sports might discourage women and girls from pursuing athletics K through 12 and in higher education? Uh, absolutely. And it's not only necessarily the domination aspect. Uh, it is the safety aspect. It is the, the, um, the fear of, of speaking out. It is the um, locker room aspect. Those are all contributors to ultimately uh, discouraging women from playing sports. And I want to say, too, it's not about domination. Uh, a male playing on a women's team, even if he places dead last, uh, it's still taking a roster spot. It's still taking an opportunity away from a deserving woman. So it's not all about domination. Uh, but yes, I certainly believe this, this issue does discourage women from playing sports. Thank you. This intrusion threatens to undermine hard-fought progress and to deter future generations from embracing the opportunity sports offer. And with my remaining time, I want to turn back to you, Ms. Perry. What more can Congress do to ensure that the Biden administration is not able to radically alter Title IX? Mm. A couple of things. Uh, at first, if this rule is published, this chamber has 60 days to be able to vote on a Congressional Review Act challenge and disapprove the law. I encourage the individuals who are forthright and brave with a courageous steeled spine to be able to do just that if for some reason a Congressional Review Act challenge fails and it goes through to the federal, federal register, I'm quite certain there are a number of individual public interest law firms that are ready to file suit and in the interim, this chamber as well as the upper chamber should consider passing legislation specifically to keep sex separated and distinct by biological sex. Thank you. Many of us in this committee and across Congress were parents and were grandparents to young women who will directly bear the consequences of an administration that chooses to ignore a scientific reality, the clear and biological differences between men and women. We cannot stand by and allow radical policies to trample on common sense, and I'm proud to yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes Ms. Luna for five minutes. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a point of order. The subcommittee will suspend. No. <laughs> I identify with my pronouns as state and state and states, and thus I move to strike deplorable states from the record. The committee will suspend. The point of order is not timely due to intervening debate occurring after the words were said. Point of order is overruled. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gaines, are you familiar with uh, the name Caitlyn Jenner? I am. Can you tell me real quick, because we are on time here, who Caitlyn Jenner is? 
Yes, uh, Caitlyn Jenner is formerly Bruce Jenner, who of course was, uh, and still is, one of the world's most renowned and accomplished athletes competing in the men's decathlon, winning uh, gold medals uh, and world records, but now of course has transitioned, identifies as Caitlyn Jenner, um, and is not competing in sports anymore, competitively. Are you aware that Caitlyn Jenner has come out against men competing in women's sports? I am. Why do you think uh, Caitlyn D Jenner did that? Given the fact that uh, he's an athlete himself, was an athlete, I believe he understands the differences between men and women. Uh, and given the fact that he has also transitioned, I believe he understands the struggles that come with gender dysphoria and what that looks like, has weighed uh, the differences between the two and still sees a fundamental unfairness about allowing men into women's sports. Um, as a member of Congress, we're in charge of putting together the guidelines for our offices, specifically referencing sexual harassment. Would you consider exposing genitalia to someone who does not want to see that as sexual harassment? I certainly would. Do you feel that you've been sexually harassed as a result of biological men competing and having to undress in front of you and other women in the locker room? I do. Uh, again, non-consensually being exploited in front of a fully naked and fully intact male, uh, I believe that meets the definition of sexual harassment. Have you ever been physically attacked by standing up for women's rights in sports? I have. Uh, can you name the biological sexes of those that have attacked you? Uh, they were men who were dressed as women. Uh, can you repeat that again? Uh, they were males who were dressed as women. So you were attacked by men? Yes. Uh, can you let me know whether or not law enforcement pressed charges? Uh, there were no charges pressed. Um, uh, the university, actually, this was at San Francisco State University. The university, in the days following, actually that next day after this attack took place, uh, where again I was held for ransom for four hours, with the police actually being held for ransom in the same room with me, uh, the university released a statement. It was Dr. Jamila Moore, who is the Vice President of Student Affairs at San Francisco State University. Uh, she released an email to their entire student body saying she was so proud of their brave students for handling me in the manner that they did, uh, applauded them, and then gave them counseling resources uh, to help cope with my presence on their campus. Um, do you think that there should be um, accountability for a man who hits a woman? Absolutely. Do you feel that you are personally being basically outed by even some members up here because of the fact that you're standing up for women's sports? Uh, yes, I believe being called transphobic for saying that women deserve privacy, that we deserve safety, that we deserve equal opportunities, we deserve uh, to maintain our dignity. Uh, I believe that is certainly an attack on my character, uh, for sure. I would just like to clarify for the record, um, I do believe in a woman's right for self-defense. So, I mean, as someone who has personally applied for my concealed carry, I think that you should do the same because obviously you're being attacked. And I think that that would be a great second debate here uh, with House Oversight. But I think that that's something that you should consider doing, being that you've received threats because of what you're doing currently. So just for the record. I'm way ahead of you. <laughs> Got it. Um, I just want to close out by saying this. You know, up here, especially being a, a new mother, I find it very ironic that people that seemed that they would champion women's rights are now throwing someone like you under the bus. And I just want to say for the record, there's no such thing as a birthing person. It's called a mother. There's no such thing as chest feeding. It's called breastfeeding. And finally, there's no such thing as equality for women if you're attempt attempting to eliminate them from sports. Thank you, Ms. Gaines. Thank you. The chair now rise, uh, recognizes Mr. Sessions for five minutes. Madam Chairman, thank you very much, and thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, I would like to, if I could, engage uh, at least uh, Ms. Perry and Mrs. Russell. Uh, as uh, as uh, coaches and people who've been in the sport for a huge number of years, uh, you've recognized the, national, uh, the NCAA uh, and their authority over sports, uh, as it conducts itself, uh, what I believe is they've always tried to create fairness, whether it's betting, whether it's hundreds of rules and regulations about recruiting, uh, things that they have rules on literally A to Z. I was a, an athlete. I don't remember if it's a D1 or D2 school, quite honestly, because if I called a D1, I think it used to be a D2 school. It's now a D1 school. But I was a D, 
one or two athlete and went through a number of rules and regulations and right and wrong and good and bad and how things work and have been used to that as as uh, one of my sons is a recruited D1 athlete. And the NCAA has a lot of governance and they always t tend to know the answer and they always tend to have a rule governing what I think is fairness, but also safety. This seems like to me that the NCAA, if they're the governing body over what occurs at NCAA meets or matches, should be very concerned about this. What is, what do you believe, where do you believe they have failed to, to provide guidance and governance and safety in this issue? Either one of you, please. I can say specifically that the NCAA has kicked the ball down the road, as it were. They have decided to leave leadership of the governing sports organizations to their own rules, developing whether or not individuals need, for example, testosterone suppression or whether or not sports can be separated by biological sex. Unfortunately, the NCAA has a significant influence. Their membership, their ranking system is a sort of, of Damocles, where the other athletic organizations, the management bodies and the institutions that want to maintain their ranking, whether that's D1, D2, or D3. And so to fail to make a unified policy, maintaining sex-separated spaces as the NCAA has recognized for years, it's ultimately made it harder for college administrators who are now faced with the Hobson's choice of do we forego our ranking, do we forego the revenue that comes with it, or do we essentially tow what is coming from the federal government's party line that sex equals gender identity? So you believe they're being led in this case by the federal government? I think it is setting the tone for the entire nation. Ms. Russell? I would agree with Ms. Perry. Um, the NCAA has passed the buck. Um, I went on their website and looked at every single sport to see what each sport's um, policy was. Many of them were the 10 nanomoles of testosterone level. Um, the most, um, the ones that had the strictest rules against biological males were triathlon and water polo. So if you want your daughters to have the best chance to play, put them in triathlons and water polo. Otherwise, good luck. Well, it seems to me that the NCAA has failed in uh, its over, by, over, what I believe is overburdensome governance that they failed in this. Uh, Ms. Gaines, you and I spoke last August in Colorado uh, and you were still very um, appropriately really shocked and surprised that, the, that this even happened without your notice, without your consent, without the coaches being aware, uh, and you considered it to be an assault. I, I'm going to use those terms, that you were uh, faced with uh, a male in a locker room. And it is it is true that I think that there should have been uh, some understanding that they were going to take advantage of you and the things that were of norm. Do you, have you clarified your, or would you clarify your ideas now about how you felt with this? Just as you said, uh, I do believe it was an assault. And, and to sum it up in words here, of course, undressing next to a male who's also undressed, of course, it's awkward. It's embarrassing, it's uncomfortable, but I believe the best words to describe this, uh, of course, it's utter violation, it's betrayal by the people who were in place to protect us, at least supposed to protect us, um, and I believe the best word is traumatic, and not even necessarily traumatic because of what we were forced to see, or again, how we were forcibly exploited. It was traumatic to me and my teammates to know just how easy it was for those people in power who created these policies to totally dismiss our rights to privacy without even a second thought, without even bare minimum forewarning us. I want to thank all, thank you. each of you, for being here today. Madam Chairman, thank you very much. I'll yield back my time. The chair now recognizes the chairman of judiciary, uh, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank all our witnesses for being here as well. Um, it's, it seems to me there are uh, 
sort of two problems here. There's there's the fundamental problem, which is, you know, letting men compete against women in sports is just crazy. I, I love what Governor Huckabee Sanders said in response to the State of the Union. She said, the divide in America today is normal versus crazy. And this is one of those obvious divides. It is crazy to think it's okay to let guys compete against girls in sports. That is just a given. The whole country knows that. Anyone with common sense understands that. But I'm also more concerned, or maybe not more concerned, just as concerned with what happens if you speak out against it, which is exactly what happened to Miss Russell. Because Miss Russell, my understanding is you had a, a comp, you, you coached what? You, first you were a Division I athlete, is that right? Yes, that's Division correct. I lacrosse player. And then you coached for, I think, 20, if I read your thing, 27, 28 years you coached? Yes. So you're not just some rookie coming off the street. You've coached a long time. You've had all kinds of success, right? You were, you've won awards. You, I think you run the national program at some, some other, not, not in the United States, but somewhere I read in your thing. Where, where do you run the national program? The U.S. Virgin Islands. So, the Virgin, so you're an accomplished coach. But because you said what was normal, you got fired. Is that right? Um. Because I said what was normal, um, it was not liked. Yeah. And, they, and I well, was canceled. Well, I, I shouldn't say fired. Yeah, yeah, you were canceled because you weren't allowed to coach anymore. They moved, they moved you somewhere else. I, I read your testimony last night. They moved you somewhere else in the, in the athletic department or in the, in the university at Overland. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. And I always tell people, don't think they won't come after you. Because I don't think you're not some, you're not, you're not some you know, crazy right-wing conservative Republican, are you, Ms. Russell? You're just, you're just a coach. In fact, you even used the term, what did you say? You're the hippie love coach? That's, That's not exactly how you describe Republicans. Normally not how you describe Republicans. So you, this is your words. You've been nicknamed the hippie love coach. You work with all your student athletes, even some, even, I think you even said some who are transgender. Yes, I've coached three transgender students. And in my um, support after I spoke out, I have had many gay men, many lesbians, and a group of transgender athletes and people who aren't athletes let me know that they support this. They support that women's sports should stay female only. Yeah, and, and they were willing to confide in you because they trusted you. They knew you were a good coach. They knew, they knew you were there to help the student athlete. They, they understood that. They were willing to come, but that wasn't good enough. This is, this is the part that is so frightening. It's never good enough for the left. It's always got to be every single thing they want or we're coming after you. Even if you're the hippie love coach, they're coming after you. And that's what they did to you. I mean, this is, this is how the left, this is how the cancel culture mob operates. It's a total attack. So this is bigger than as bad as it is what Miss Gaines described, what she had to go through. Now, if I, if I remember your story right, Miss Gaines, you won, but you weren't, you, were, you weren't able to be number one because of this Leah Thomas individual. You actually won the right. I mean, bad enough as that is, this attack on the First Amendment and your right to speak out against that is just as bad and just as scary because that's across the board. And I tell people all the time, you have five liberties under the First Amendment. Your right to practice your faith, your right to assemble, your right to petition the government, free press, free speech. The most important one by far is your right to talk. Because if you can't talk, you can't practice your faith, you can't share your faith, you can't petition your government, and you spoke out against something that anyone with any common sense knows is ridiculous, and they came after you. That's why this panel, and Chairman, thank you for doing this, this panel and this subject is so darn important because it's fundamental to who we are as a country. You can't have a country if you're only allowed to say what the left says is okay. And for people who stand up and defend that, they need to, Miss, Miss uh, Goss Graves, I, I don't know, I wasn't able to be here for all of this, but my guess is you're, you're defending this, this idea that, that guys can compete against girls. Maybe not, I didn't hear it. But don't think they won't come after you at some point too. I mean, here's how bad the left is. The left, the left, Dianne Feinstein, liberal, iconic senator for the left, wasn't even good enough for the left. It was the Dianne Feinstein Elementary School in Sanford. They went back and found something she said 30 years ago, and they said, we got to rename the school. So no one is safe. If they can go after Miss Russell, 27 years coaching for saying something that everybody knows is true, then come after anybody. And that is a dangerous world to live in. I, I didn't mean to speak that long. I actually wanted to, ask, to let you guys talk. Miss Gaines or Miss Perry, if you want to say something, go right ahead. 
I think what we're seeing is sort of this philosophical devolution on truth. We've gone from an ontological perspective on truth. Truth is truth no matter how you feel to a consequentialist approach on truth. Truth is truth so long as it doesn't hurt your feelings. The law doesn't care about feelings. The law is the law so that we have a method of American constitutional governance. And Title IX and the Constitution are very cut and dry. It doesn't matter whose feelings are hurt. And if there are indeed less than 1% of individuals in the country who are transgender, as Representative Garcia mentioned, why the urgency from the Biden Department of Education to suddenly upend 50 years of civil rights protections for biological women who benefit Crazy. from Title IX? That is throwing the entire canon of civil rights law on its head. Thank you all. Uh, Madam Chair, you thank you. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Ms. Green for five minutes. Thank you, and thank you, Chairwoman McLean, for holding this hearing. It's extremely important. I say that not only as a former athlete, but also very proud mother of a daughter who played her entire life, earned her D1 uh, uh, scholarship uh, to her sport, which was softball. I'm so proud of her, proud of her records, and I'm also very grateful. She never had her opportunities, her records she set, stolen from her from a biological man trying to replace her, beat her, dominate her in her sport. So I'm very thankful. I can't believe we're here though. I can't believe we're holding a hearing today. As a matter of fact, I can't believe many things. Uh, today we have something called gender affirming care in our country, which is really cutting off the body parts of people in order to make them feel like they're another gender, which is completely wrong. And this is something being pushed on kids, cutting off their breast, castrating them, uh, which really will lead to lifelong debilitating uh, conditions, physical conditions, and mental illness. Hopefully not suicide, but unfortunately that is the case. Uh, we're all, uh, reproductive health care has been mentioned here. Even the term reproductive justice, which is really capital punishment for innocent babies. That's, there's nothing reproductive about abortion. It's murder. But one thing I'd like to talk about right now is the Gallup poll that was done in May of 2023. 69% say transgender athletes should play on teams that match their birth gender or biological sex. But guess what? That's actually gone up because the left is losing the battle. Because in, in 2020, May of 2020, the exact same Gallup poll was done and it was only 62% that agreed that transgender athletes should play on teams that match their birth gender or biological sex. So watching biological men dominating real women in sports is moving America's opinion to defend biological women and Title IX. This is a losing issue for Democrats because America fully agrees we have to protect women's sports. Ms. Goss Graves, in 2013, the National Women's Law Center tweeted, what have sports meant to you or a girl you know? Tweet it with the hashtag, and then you put the hashtag. You responded, National Girls and Women in Sports Day, I'm grateful to tennis. It is my late night outlet that I still play 20 years after high school. Do you still play tennis, Ms. Gosgraves? I, not well anymore. My knees struggle. But it's a great sport, and it's, it's always fun. Sport. Yes, I've enjoyed playing. And sport. you mentioned that you're a fan of Serena Williams. Is that right? I am. I'm a Williams sister fan. I'm a tennis fan. I'm actually a fan of most sports. I grew up playing sports and in a family that understood that there is so much value in playing sports, whether you're the best or not the best. I agree with you, and I'm a fan of Serena Williams, too. I think she's strong, I think she's powerful, and I think she's beautiful. In 2013, Serena Williams stated, if I were to play Andy Murray, I would lose six to zero, six to zero in five to six minutes, maybe 10 minutes. No, it's true. It's a completely different sport. The men are a lot faster and they serve harder, they hit harder. It's just a different game. So sounds like she, can, she doesn't think she could beat men either. But let's talk about some of your comments. You said that uh, this is attacking and dehumanizing on trans. Um, Ms. Goss Graves, how do you think Ms. Gaines felt 
Do you think she felt dehumanized being forced to undress in front of men in her sports or attacked? Here's what I think. That's about a yes the, or no question. But I, if I could being forced to question, undress in front of Madam a man Chairman, isn't that dehumanizing if I or attacking? Could answer this question, Madam Chairman, because I actually think this is really, really important. The issue of privacy in locker rooms and in bathrooms, there's a wide range of so ways. So you feel like Ms. Gaines should have had privacy? To address that. You could put up a curtain, you could put up a door, you could have rotation. So I reclaim my time, Ms. Goss Graves. Ms. Gaines, did you feel attacked and dehumanized? Ms. Gaines, did you feel attacked and dehumanized? I certainly did. Uh, and in swimming locker rooms, there are no curtains, there are no stalls, there are no doors. But there it could be. There could be curtains. This that's, is, that's, uh, we, I reclaim my time. It's Miss Gaines right now. Uh, that would be restructuring our, how, we've, how I've competed in my entire 18 years of competing uh, for what we've described in this hearing today as such a small percentage of the population. We would restructure and uproot what we're used to and, and what works and um, allows us to be, I think we can all agree, a locker room in general is not a, is not a comfortable place, even of course in dressing in front of all women. But growing up a swimmer in that environment, again for 18 years of my life, you, you become comfortable being vulnerable in that environment. And I had, and my teammates and my competitors, we had our vulnerability stripped from us by the leaders of the NCAA, uh, and again those who implemented this policy. Thank you, Ms. Gaines. I yelled. Thank you. The chair, the chair now recognizes Mr. Burchett for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Lady, and thank you for bringing this important matter to our attention. Uh, Ms. Gaines, in your experience, <clears throat> do the um, biological men competing in women's sports start competing before or after taking hormones? Uh, I, I guess it depends, uh, but I've certainly seen both ways. Both? Okay. Uh, what guidelines does the National a collegiate athletic associate NCAA have regarding male to female student athletes being treated with testosterone suppression? Well, from 2010 to 2022, they had a blanket policy in place for all sports that said just 12 months of hormone replacement therapy and you compete with the team that aligns with your gender identity. Uh, but now the NCAA, and I think this is incredibly telling, they're in a phase out approach, meaning they want nothing to do with the topic, uh, which I think is, again, if they wholeheartedly stood by the fact that they believed males could be women and become the same as women, they would stand by their policy, but they're not. Uh, they wanna leave uh, the responsibility and accountability up to each specific sport governing body. I believe they're in phase three or so of this approach uh, and it should be done by 2024, 2025. Wouldn't men competing in women's sports at the collegiate level have already gone through puberty? Uh, I, again, I don't know the exact statistic, but every single male that I've seen competing, competing at the collegiate level in the women's category uh, has gone through male puberty. Right. If a male takes a year of testosterone suppressants, does his bone structure and muscle mass change enough for him to be similar to biological women? Uh, no, nor does his height, nor does his lung capacity, nor does his, right. height si or his heart size, his wingspan, foot size, and, list goes on. And doesn't t testosterone have permanent effects through early life exposure? Of course. Okay. Uh, Ms. Gaines, another question. Once a man has started competing on a women's team, do they ever switch back to compete on male teams? Uh, not that I have seen. Actually, I will say there was a, a half marathon runner uh, or a marathon runner who just won in the, the open category, the non-binary division at the Boston Marathon. Uh, again, a male identifying as a woman. He's competed just this year alone in the men's, women's, and open category. Okay. Ms. Graves, in 2022, you tweeted, maybe anti-trans laws are not actually about protecting women's sports. Uh, that's not true. These laws are not only to, are to protect women's sports, but women too. Last year, a biological male playing on a women's uh, volleyball team spiked a high-speed ball into a girl's face, causing a concussion. And I believe I have the video, if we can show that. See, he just rifled it right into her head. Um, and that's not the only example. Recently, during a field hockey game in Massachusetts, a biological male hit a female player in the, pl in the face, reportedly knocking her teeth out. In another instance, three female rugby players were injured by a bi biological male player. And these are not just things that they just, these are not just rare occurrences. You can find them all over the place, even in, in Tennessee, if you would look close enough. Um, Ms. Graves, do you have any concerns that all, uh, at all about biological males 
competing in women's sports injuries, um, sports injuring females? I have deep concerns around injuries generally in sports, and I think the answer for this body, if they are interested, are the sorts of resources that reduce injuries. injuries. No, but Adequate I mean, but they, are they not higher among biological equipment. men? Though, I mean, the thing is, I, I, I know this is hard to hear, that people who play sports, that injury is a part of it. And it is unfortunate, and yet people still play because they love it. They love playing. Yes, ma'am, but when you I take away their a kid, ability to I compete against some, ma'am, I'm talking, please. I apologize, but when you take away their ability to compete by putting someone who is far superior biologically, that's the way God made them. It may become as some uh, disruptive talk to some folks up here, but that's just the way it is. It, it is not fair. Um, so, so that was basically a yes to my question, and I want to. Um, no, it. it it, I don't think it was. I think what I was trying to say that I am concerned about injuries in sports, and I think there are things to do to reduce injuries in sports, and that additional resources to ensure things like coaching, to ensure things like equipment are more equal, okay, let me, let me stop. would actually reduce injuries that girls across this country face because they play sports. Yes, ma'am, but they don't play contact sports against men. Now, Ms. Gaines, would you care to comment on that? Sorry. Yes, I absolutely agree. Uh, allowing men into women's sports, of course, uh, increases the severity and the greater likelihood of women getting injured, and to ignore that is entirely disingenuous. And, and let me just add one more point about this NCAA championships in particular that I find to be incredibly interesting that we haven't talked about in this committee. And that same meet where we had Thomas, who, of course, is a male identifying as a woman, we had another trans athlete who was a female identifying as a man. We were told we had to refer to this person using he, him pronouns. And, and so I guess I, I wish there were more Democratic members on the committee because I would love to ask just plain and simple the question of do we believe that that person that we are forced to compete against uh, from Yale, Izzy Hennig, who now identifies as Isaac Hennig, should compete against the men? And why did this person compete with the women? And I can answer that question. It's because Izzy, now Isaac, would never and will never be able to compete at the same level against the male. So not only were we faced, um, I guess, uh, facing this discrimination uh, against male athletes, we also had a fem female identifying as a man competing with the women, which I have no problem with if there was no testosterone being thank, taken. Thank you, all, and thank you, ladies. There, are, there are Democrats on this committee. They just chose not to be here because... This is obviously Th such an obvious answer to these questions. Thank you, Chair Lady. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes Mr. LaMaffa for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I appreciate you allowing me to sit in on committee here today. Um, it's uh, a, lot, a lot of contentious uh, discussion here today. Uh, we've seen um, a lot of name calling, uh, people referring to people with different ideas or disagreements as some type of phobes, transphobes or homophobes or whatever. In, uh, that's not really a place where you uh, have ideas or discussion about differences of, uh, on, on important issues. So um, I've even seen in my home state of California where uh, parents would uh, want to talk with their children about uh, if they're feeling feelings of wanting to associate with another gender, for example, that our California legislature has shut down the ability for kids to have counseling. So if there's phobes on this, and I saw at the beginning of the hearing, Ms. Gaines was uh, uh, moved by a Democrat member to have her words taken down because she cared to disagree with the name calling that was being called her and instead put one back on say, well, maybe you're a misogynist for not agreeing, you know. So uh, it's, it's pretty discouraging that you can't have a rational conversation here so, or, or even counseling for kids in, in California. Um, it, it looks a lot like canceling to me. So. Uh, I wanted a, a question for uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Graves there. Now, you're the president of what's known as the National Women's Law Center, right? That's correct. Okay. So we saw this report where um, a, a, a girl on a school trip was forced to share a bed in a motel room, I guess, for expediency. I think she was about seventh grade, and a boy was probably about seventh grade. Does that seem like a good idea? at that age, and what would the parents think about it, let alone what would the girl think about that? Is that, is that a policy that uh, your organization would support? I, I'm sorry, I don't, 
I'm struggling to understand the example that you're talking about. There was a it's, school it's been trip where boys and uh, girls were sharing a bed. I'm, yeah, uh, I, uh, I have never heard of a school this Well, this, as a policy, as a generic policy, what, what would you think of that? I would advise that schools not require their students to share beds. Well, I, I, I mean, I don't. Maybe for expediency for a trip, girls with girls, boys with boys, whatever, if that's what they came up with. In this case here, because they wanted to protect this identity, they forced this girl to be in that situation sharing with a boy. Does that seem like a good idea to you? So are you trying to call a transgender girl a boy? I'm just trying to understand the example that you're giving me. But in, in any of that... You know what I'm talking about. A, a, a I, so, one... so here's what I would say. I would advise schools to not have students share beds. I would advise schools to be really clear. If In this they case, they required like it because that's what they did, and they required the school. Well, I would advise boys, so against it. So I would say okay. that that is right. not a good idea. Schools have right. a long-standing right. obligation move, to address move to a different harassment and let's move to create a different conditions so, where students can thrive. In general, it doesn't sound like uh, that's a, a, in, for women, girls and women's safety. So um, I have not heard your organization yet speak out against the horrific or condemn publicly what's gone on with Hamas and the Jewish women that were uh, dismembered in, by rape, by torture, the dehumanizing of Jewish women. Would you like to hear clarify for us uh, how your organization would feel about that? So rape in conflict and the information that's come out about what happened to women in Israel is horrific and devastating and God awful. Well, many lead organizations and have not even expressed anything, it seems to be pro-Hamas. Is your organization willing to go on the record and say we're against what Hamas did to women? We're I against, mean, we're it, against Hamas. So I should just be really clear. I, I don't support groups, but I also don't do global work. Okay. I work in the United right. States on gender right. justice issues. I'll reclaim issues, my time. Thank you. But I am an expert Reclaiming on sexual my time. violence. Okay. And uh, rape is horrific in any setting, and the fact sure. that in the context of Reclaiming my of time, war please. Ms. Gaines, conflict, I would like to switch a question to you. This is so important, and I don't want to lead any mis- You didn't answer the question well, correctly, and that's He's correct. reclaimed his time. Okay. So, um, Ms. Gaines, again, you've been uh, uh, courageous in your battle with the name-calling and the stuff that happened in San Francisco. Um, let me talk about, real quick, um, when you have transgender athletes, as they're called, participating in a sport, and let's say in track, for example, the top two are former males. They, re they claim the top two spots. They qualify for you know, scholarships in college, the first two places at, at the, inter you know, the national meets. What does that feel like for the girls? Do, do they, A, want to start boycotting uh, uh, games where there's males playing, or do they just want to give up altogether? What is that going to do for women's sports if more and more of this happens? It's certainly a mix. Uh, there are some women who would love to boycott, but we've been told, you know, you signed a scholarship. Uh, so there's fear of retaliation from your school. Uh, there are some women who were so discouraged they quit. Speaking of, uh, again, the case that we saw with Leah Thomas, I know I've referenced it a lot, but it is, of course, my lived experience. Uh, the University of Princeton had, I, I believe, 13 of their swimmers quit the sport entirely to stop playing. Uh, being in the Ivy League, having to deal with this time and time and time again. And after talking with those girls, they explicitly stated they quit because they were um, subjected to, to allowing men into their sports and locker rooms. So if girls don't want to share a bed, they don't want to share a locker room, if they feel like they're being violated and they finally sit out the sport, is that, is that really good for, for example, uh, executives? 94% of the the, executives have been in women's sports. Probably not good for them, huh? The, Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. In closing, I want to thank all of you very much for taking time out of your day to be here today. Um, I want to thank you for your testimony. Um, I know it's heartfelt, um, and I appreciate it. It means a lot to me as a mother, as an athlete, as a coach, as a woman. So thank you for being here. I now want to close and I want to yield to the ranking member, Ms. Lee, for her closing remarks. Ms. Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, I just want to seek unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, this statement by the National Center for Transgender Equity, excuse me, equality. A recurring theme. So ordered. Thank you. 
A recurring theme from my Republican colleagues and their witnesses is that trans girls are more likely to injure other players during sports. I'd like to read a statement by a trans female high school rugby player, and I quote, at five foot seven and approximately 140 pounds, I routinely go up against other women from five foot three, 100 pound players who are quick and agile, to six feet tall, 250 pound women who are nearly double my size. She continued, and I quote, and during a scrimmage a few weeks later, I had my arm broken in a collision with a cisgender player. While unfortunately, I can't help but chuckle because my experience is the opposite of narratives playing on unfounded fears that cisgender women face a higher risk of injury from transgender women on the field. My colleagues are grasping at straws for arguments to support their transphobic and dangerous stereotypical views of women's bodies. I think this hearing has shown how vital immediate action is to protect our transgender young people. On April 6, 2023, the Department of Education announced a proposed revision to Title IX regulations on students' eligibility for athletic teams. The administration's proposed revision to Title IX would prevent institutions that receive federal funding from applying blanket sex-related criteria that would limit or deny a student's ability to participate on a male or female team consistent with their gender identity. This proposed revision must be finalized. We've seen how without these protections, Title IX can be weaponized against transgender students. During her time running the Department of Education, Secretary DeVos repeatedly leveraged Title IX's prohibition of sex discrimination to roll back protections for transgender student athletes. For example, in May 2020, the Department of Education prevented a Connecticut high school from maintaining its policy allowing transgender students to participate in athletics on a team corresponding to their gender identity. In another case, from 2020, Secretary DeVos's department successfully forced Franklin Pierce University to rescind its transgender participation and inclusion policy despite the policy's compliance with the NCAA guidance for transgender athletes. We need our Department of Education to be able to stand up and defend our transgender students because they, like all willing young people, deserve to participate in sports. Transgender youth participant, participate in sports for the same reasons as everyone else, to build and nurture friendships, increase self-esteem, and develop crucial skills like teamwork and discipline. Equal access to school programs go hand in hand with academic excellence. The Trevor Project found that transgender and non-binary athletes had significantly higher grades than their transgender and non-binary peers who do not participate in sports. You do not have to be an expert on what it means to be transgender to understand that singling out a small group of youth who simply want to participate with their peers is not how we as elected officials should be spending our time. These youth already face stigma and bullying, and these attacks only exacerbate those challenges. Youth sports should be open to all, and policing the bodies or appearances of our youth hurts everyone. The anti-trans sports bills being signed into law across the country seek to create a problem that just doesn't exist, all for the sake of perpetuating hate against vulnerable groups. This isn't about preserving competition in sports. It's a way to mobilize would-be voters by turning trans rights into a political football. I encourage the Department of Education to prioritize finalizing this proposed revision to protect our transgender youth. And I encourage my Republican colleagues to stop picking on kids. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Whatever happened to I am woman, hear me roar. What, it, what have we lost our minds? I sat here and listened to every, every label imaginable. I, I am here to protect women, girls. My God, why do I have to apologize for that? We spent decades trying to protect women. And you know what? We won. We won. So I will not apologize now or ever for trying to protect my daughters and women in sports. And that's what this hearing was about protecting women. So you know what? I am a woman, and let me tell you, hear me roar, because I will not stop protecting women. You want to know why? Because we have rights, too. Women have rights, too. And our daughters have rights, too. Let me be explicitly clear on that. And I will never stop protecting our daughters. I will never stop protecting women. That is my job as a mother, and it is the right thing to do. 
this hearing today has been extremely informative and heartbreaking. Frankly, I am mystified by the Biden administration's shameless failures to protect women's rights. We talk about protecting women's rights like that's such a bad thing, that that's so evil to protect women's rights. Have we lost our mind? The administration's proposed Title IX rule will re rewind decades of progress in women's rights. The Biden administration is weakening Title IX by allowing all males who identify as women to participate in women's sports. Okay, identify as woman. How about just be a woman? Why can't I protect my women? Why can't I protect my daughters? Title IX was implemented by Congress to give women equal educational opportunities, including within federally funded school athletic programs. No, we're not there. Do we have a lot of work to do? You're doggone right, we, we do. But if this language gets in by the Biden administration, it will definitely not help women, I can assure you that. It will not help us on the progress route. The Biden administration's rule would, would eliminate women's sports as we know it. That's a fact. And you know how it starts? It starts little by little by little by little. All you got to do is look at it, it, it. It's called the salami mentality. Little by little by little. It starts by just a little. And then before you know it, look at our tax system, right? As we have discussed today, the Biden administration has no legal grounds to support this rule. Congress is the nation's lawmaking body, not unelected bureaucrats in the Biden administration. In this world, in a world where biological males compete in women's sports, women lose access to roster spots. It's true. It's not about your feelings. It is the fact. Women lose championships, records, and scholarships. That's just a fact. I'm sorry if it doesn't fit your narrative, but it's the fact. Women face serious injuries from contact sports with phys physically biological um, or larger biological males. Again, don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Women face emotional trauma of exposure to biological males in spaces that should be safe and private for women, like the locker room. And why should women have to change all the time? Would have been nice if we got a little heads up, Riley, huh? About, hey, we got, we got a biological male competing. Would have been nice to have a heads up. Then maybe we could have put the curtain up. But we don't even bother to tell anybody. What about defending our women? What about defending my daughters? Don't I have a right? You know what? I say yes, I do. The proposed Department of Education rules will do nothing to preserve the safety or fairness of women's sports. This is about protecting girls and women. This is about protecting our daughters, our sisters, our nieces, and our granddaughters. And you know what? Lisa McLean is here to fight for them. That's why I've drafted a bill, Save Women's Sports Act, the, the, to protect sports and fair competition across the nation. Remember Title IX that we fought so hard for? My bill prohibits any school or university that receives federal funding from allowing biological males from participating in women's sports. So you can do it. We're just not funding it. If schools violate the provision of this bill, they lose access to all federal funding. You can be who you want to be, but the American people don't have to fund it, especially since about 70% of them actually agree with me. Simply put, this bill will stop the pattern of unremarkable male athletes that switch to women's sports and suddenly come in first place. Men like those we have heard stories about, men like the ones we've heard stories about today. I ask my colleagues to join me in protecting women's sports by signing this bill. In closing, again, I want to thank our panelists once again for your brave and important testimony today. I'm sure you're going to get canceled. I'm sure I'm going to get canceled. But you know what that tells me? My ladder's on the right wall, and I'm doing the right thing. Thank you for sharing your stories. I do appreciate it. And with that, without objection, all members have five, le five legislative days within which to submit materials and additional written questions for the witnesses, which will be forwarded to the witnesses. If there is no further business without objection, Objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned.
Yeah, no kidding. <laughs>